Okay, good afternoon, everyone. This is the Budget and Tax Committee <clears throat> hearing for February 17th. I'm Guy Gazzoni. Um, honored to be the chair of the committee. We have 15 bills today, uh, a couple of housekeeping. <clears throat> One, uh, for those of you who out there in our viewing audience, there'll be members uh, coming in and out um, based on having to testify in other committees. And uh, for those who are actually testifying, the Senator will have the opportunity to present the bill, take the time they need. Then their first witness, if needed, can have up to five minutes as their expert witness. And then after that, all witnesses will be two and a half minutes. Um, we have a sort of loose system of keeping time, but um, I will use it um, uh, when necessary. So uh, that being said, we're going to start with the first bill from the Carroll County Center, Senator Reedy. Good, Good, you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, members, uh, members of the Budget and Taxation Committee. I'm here before you today to uh, present Senate Bill 612, which is Carroll County Public Facilities Bond. Uh, for those on the committee that may not uh, be, know, uh, we're a, a commissioner form of government, so we have our bond authorization through the state, as I know you're familiar with from some of the other counties. This would authorize the county commissioners of Carroll County to borrow uh, not more than $48.45 million to finance construction, improvement, and development of public facilities um, and other projects in Carroll County. There is a list in your packet. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it will allow them to affect issuance and sale at public and private sale general obligation bonds. So, I would uh, be happy to answer any questions, but I uh, would ask a favorable uh, report. And um, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I do have a witness down here. Uh, it's my old, is this my old friend, Mike Fowler? He's, he's coming in now. I think he's probably here just to answer questions, but I, if we wait a second, just in case he would like to add anything, I, I don't. I, there he is. Mr. That, is, that is my old friend, Mike Fowler. Hey, Mr. Chairman, good to see you, even if it's virtually. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, Mike Fowler for the record uh, from the uh, Carroll County Commissioners uh, here to request a favorable for the reasons that uh, Senator Reedy has outlined to you, so thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Questions for the Senator or witness? Thank you very much. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Next up, uh, Senator Keys, <laughs> sales and use and vehicle excise tax, peer-to-peer -peer car sharing and short-term vehicle rentals, alterations and distributions. And I think you might get the winner for today. <laughs> <laughs> Senator? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon to the members of the Budget and Tax. My name is Senator Antonio Hayes, for the record. Uh, I just wanted to start and say thank you. Uh, this is the first time I've had a chance to come into this committee before you all, since you all have passed one of the most significant pieces of legislation of this legislative session, delivering for all Marylanders. I know we all played a role in it, but it was this committee that did the hard work. So thank you all so much for your effort and time and energy that went into that, as well as the HBCU legislation earlier um, this session. It was definitely a beginning um, to good things ahead. Um, but good afternoon. I'm pleased uh, to be here today to introduce Senate Bill 688, which is an opportunity to help provide supplemental funding for HBCUs through SB 001. For far too long, historically black colleges and universities often referred to as HBCUs in this state have been told that despite the importance of their mission, adequate funding is simply unattainable. Despite this, Maryland annually loses out on tens of millions of dollars in subsidies in the form of tax exemptions provided to large corporations, allowing them to escape their tax obligations at the expense of Maryland educational and social priorities. Senate Bill 688 represents an opportunity to correct legislation from nearly three decades ago in order to help provide supplemental funding to SB1. The titling tax exemption for rental car companies was granted in 1993, 
with industry assurances that the industry would recapture lost state revenue by collecting it through a larger rental cars, <coughs> excuse me, car sales tax for consumers to be collected at the counter. Large car rental corporations will be exempt from paying the toddling tax on purchasing new vehicles in exchange for an increase in sales and use tax on rental vehicles. Over time, the value of the tax exemption on tax, titling tax has vastly outpaced the revenue generated by the increase in the sales and use tax. Senate Bill 666 strikes, uh, <clears throat> seeks to strike this tax exemption to recoup the lost funds. It also creates a provision for this newly collected excise tax to be granted to the HBCU fund. In addition, Senate Bill 688 will lower the sale and use tax on rental vehicles to the original 8% to match the rate established by peer-to-peer -peer sharing platforms, essentially leveling the playing field between the industries and removing the industry's tax obligations from consumers. I, I call the committee's attention to the fiscal note and that it states that the motor vehicle excise tax for rental vehicles will reduce state expenditures by approximately 84.4 million in fiscal year 2020. After the revenue from sales and uses attracted roughly 34 million in revenue, this amounts to an unattainable annual 50 to $65 million loss. The fiscal note on this bill goes on to state that the impact of this legislation will be that the state revenues will increase by $65 million in FY22 and by $75.3 million in FY2026, revenue that should be dedicated to our, the funding of our HBCUs. The original legislation that codified titling tax exemption was intended to be revenue neutral according to the legislative history. In the 27 years since this legislation passed, we have failed to audit and reassess the true impact of continuing to provide this exemption. In light of the underfunding of institutions so essential to the education of Maryland's Black community, removing the unanticipated windfall received by one industry simply makes sense and is overdue. Allowing corporations who reap billions of dollars in profits to escape their tax obligations while HBCUs remain underfunded is paradoxical to the purpose and duty of this legislature. As this assembly seeks to evaluate legislation with a heightened scrutiny to ensure equity and inclusion, Senate Bill 688 is an opportunity to turn public pronouncement to action in the best interest of Maryland students. Thus, I urge a favorable report for Senate Bill 688. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Chris DiPietro. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Chris DiPietro. I'm here on behalf of Toro. Toro <coughs> is the peer-to-peer -peer car sharing company uh, that operates in the state. We were the driving force behind the 2018 legislation that created uh, the framework by which our industry operates, not only here in Maryland, but was really one of the, the, the first uh, modern peer-to-peer -peer car sharing statutes in the country. I uh, want to first thank Senator Hayes for bringing this issue to this committee. I think the heart of this issue from our perspective, and I think from Senator Hayes's perspective, this is an issue of fair about fairness and about parity, not only for the peer-to-peer -peer car sharing industry as it relates to the traditional car rental industry, but also the, the HBCUs that have been severely underfunded over the years. We're looking for fairness and parity there as well. So I wanna give a kind of a very brief run uh, overview of why we are where we are today. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we set up this uh, statute in 2018. The initial statute called for a 8% tax. Our industry advocated for a 6% tax. We thought that was the fair way to go. Um, but in late hour negotiations, the car rental industry threw uh, 8% out on the table. Uh, it, it, it ended up in the bill with really no rhyme or reason why it should be 8%. We were going with the sales and use tax and we thought that was appropriate. Um, 
but but and then that that sunset it uh, was supposed to sunset originally last year in 2020. So there was two pieces of legislation that this committee had before it last year, Senate Bill 825 and Senate Bill 573. 870, 825 was from our industry. We were asking again to go to that six percent because we thought that that was the fair way to go. We are separate and different and distinct in the eyes of the law. Uh, from car rental, and we thought that was the appropriate way to proceed. Um, our, uh, the, the competitive bill to that one, uh, 573, actually looked to, from the industry, from the car rental industry's point of view, to grant parity between their 11.5% rate and where we were. And even in, in um, the analysis of that bill, it says it was introduced as introduced, it would achieve parity between the car rental and peer-to-peer -peer car sharing industries. <clears throat> so that was the objective that the car rental industry put forward. They wanted parity at the at the counter uh, for them. We don't have a counter, but and we we just have the tax that we collect. But they didn't want to take into account um, parity on the back end, and that's when you purchase the vehicle. Remember that we are different in that the vehicles that are listed on our site by use by other individuals are owned by the citizens of Maryland. The peer-to-peer -peer car sharing platform does not own any vehicles. There is no fleet of vehicles that are owned. Those vehicles that are owned by those consumers have paid the 6% excise tax when they purchased the car. So your constituents have paid that, that uh, tax upfront. So, but I'm going to turn back even a little bit further than that, back to the 1990s, when this, this scheme was originally adopted by the General Assembly at the urging of the car rental industry. And in particular, I did a one pager that should be in your, um, in, in your uh, handouts that look at Senate Bill 620 from 1993. The argument from industry, and I'm quoting from a letter from the Maryland Car Rental Coalition. Uh, to the Budget and Tax Committee on February 19th, 1993. The 620 represents our initial draft of the plan to ease the impact of the titling tax on this industry while holding the state's revenues neutral. That was what they stated. And that's kind of where they were back in that day. Um, and in, 90, in 1981, uh, when they started going down this road, there, there was a positive impact to the state finances. And then it was about a million dollars in the hole for the state in 93. Now we are where we are. And even when you look back at the fiscal note from that bill from 1993, the fiscal note says the change was intended to be revenue neutral to the state while encouraging rental companies to purchase and register cars and vehicles in Maryland. So it was done for a host of reasons. I'm not gonna question the wisdom of the Budget and Tax Committee back in the 90s. We are where we are, but as Senator Hayes said, the, the state has not really seriously taken a look at this, this um, imbalance that exists uh, since for 20, 27, 28 years. That's what we're asking you to do. There's, there's quite a large pot of money there. If we truly are gonna get parity in this industry, this is, this, is, uh, this is something I think this committee should seriously study. I know in past testimony, the car rental industry wants to say, hey, if, if, if peer to peer compared to us, if it looks like a duck, one of my friends here on the screen always said this, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a duck, you should tax them the same way. I, the the Petra, law, you, need to, you need to wrap up. Okay, I'm just gonna say the law simply does not support that. Uh, the statute that's that's uh, was adopted in nineteen um, in two thousand eighteen. So we asked for a favorable report on this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Alfred. Do you have a question for this particular witness, or you, can you wait till the end? For this witness, I can be brief, Mr. Go ahead. Thank you, yep. Mr. D. Pitcher, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the sponsor. I know he his com complete commitment to seeing our HBCUs funded the way they need to, and and we were all proud to vote on that last week. But Mr. D. Pitcher, I see that Toro makes in the hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue every year. How much of that have you as a company contributed to HBCUs around the country? I, I feel like we all agree with this mission. We all agree we need to make this investment. We've ma made it as a state. I'm just curious why Toro has chosen this particular. Well, it's a very good and legitimate question. Thank you, Senator, for asking that. Uh, first of all, um, the, the funding to, to have the excess go to HBCUs was not Toro's idea. We didn't come to this. This when we were bouncing around this idea with various legislators, and we knew that there was going to be a, a large pot of money 
if there really was parity, you know, folks said, well, the need is with HBCUs. Why don't we put the money there? So that's why we went down that road. Specifically to Toro, of course not. I mean, you know, it's it's a pr pretty small company. I would say, ask the same question of some of the other witnesses that are coming up. Enterprise is a $22 billion company. Ask how much they've given to HBCUs. I don't know the answer to that, but I would like to know the answer to that. We, I can't, I'll let to, uh, Lou Bertuka, who's speaking right after me, he might have more clarification on that Thank answer. You're welcome. Mr. Chairman and, and members of the committee, with all due respect, I just want to correct one thing. Yes, the committee, and we thank you for your commitment for HBCUs, but I don't want to leave here with the impression that the HBCU legislation solved all ills and that is mission accomplished. Um, there, there's still a long way to go. This was definitely a good faith effort and a settlement agreement, but I think um, any of the HBCUs is tell you that it doesn't make them completely whole. So just wanted to caution there. Okay, very good. Uh, Louis Bertuka. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you members of the committee. I'm Lou Bertuka, I head government relations for Turo. Uh, I'm actually the son of a Baltimore Colt. So this is really a, a, a pleasure of mine to be able to speak in front of this, this body today. Um, I know I don't have a lot of time, but to echo off of my colleague, Chris DiPietro, peer-to-peer um, -peer car sharing and enterprise have been butting heads for a long, long time in many different states, not just in Maryland. Um, and around the country, legislatures are looking at this exemption. But in Maryland, we actually do have the legislative history to show uh, testimony where enterprise rental car and their lobbyists said that this exemption was in exchange for a back end sales tax increase. We have that. And it was said at the time that it would be revenue neutral. The Department of Transportation contended that it would not be at the time, but it was ignored. In the meantime, we flash forward to today and we had gave everybody a handout that said it would probably cost the state about $50 million annually. I guess we were wrong. The fiscal note says $65 million annually. So when enterprise says that we want parity and they want to pass all of the burdens on of being a rental car company to our hosts, Maryland citizens, they never talk about the front end benefit and the exchange and the trade, which was not a good bargain for the state of Maryland at the time. $65 million this year, $65 million last year, you can extrapolate that um, as, as far as we go. Now the state of Oregon, uh, where they do not have legislative statute, the highest court of tax appeals, just recently stated in August of 2020, and I wanna make sure I get this right, they denied enterprises claim to be exempt from these taxes. Taxpayer does not acquire cars for the purpose of engaging in the transfer of title. These are the biggest accountants in the state of Oregon. Taxpayer does not seriously contend that it is not the consumer of the cars. A term it acknowledges means utilize or use. So what they're doing is buying these cars tax-free using them in their traditional rental car business. They are not transferring title and then they turn around and sell them. So this inequity has cost Marylanders just this year, $65 million. We're not asking for lower taxes. We're still at 8% in this bill, but we feel this bill serves the purpose of, of solving the problem that enterprise says exists, that they pay higher taxes on the back and 11.5% and brings them down to 8%. So all it does is reverse course from the 1993 legislation. They may say that they're this would be tragic for traditional rental car companies if this exemption were taken away. Well, I would say, why didn't they shut down any of their organ operations? I think this is, is, is a bill of priorities. Um, that money could have went to other causes through the years and I, and I am in full support of the bill right now. Um, it was not revenue neutral in 1993. It is not revenue neutral today. And um, it's time to, to, to write that. We are a big supporter of this bill and, and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Next up is Willie Flowers. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. How are you? Um, good, good to see you. Good evening, uh, good afternoon rather. Certainly um, acknowledge the, the significance of this day. So the day is that um, the NAACP will celebrate the life of Matthias de Souza to um, connect with the history of the state of Maryland and your august body. Um, Senator Hayes has brought forth for your consideration through Senate Bill 
an important opportunity to realign tax policy of our state with the priorities of Maryland residents. Eight years ago, as you know, the Maryland courts confirmed the historic, that historically black colleges and universities were underfunded and ordered a remedy. The legislator has worked hard to resolve this matter, passing legislation last year only to have it vetoed. While new legislation is being considered, it will take years to recover from the damage caused by years of delay, even when the legislation is approved. If you visit Coppin University, you will see its 50 year old student center. And in the fall, you'll see its wait list for student housing to get an idea of the impact of underfunding, not to mention the lack of funding needed to advance innovation, new programming for students, and to recruit and retain staff. During this time, while two governors and the legislator have struggled to find funding to stabilize and improve HBCUs, tax breaks to industries have remained intact. I fully understand a tax break uh, or exemption can spur economic development and, and create jobs. However, these exemptions should be evaluated to ensure the state is getting the benefit of the bargain. The rental car titling tax industry has been explained earlier. Uh, it was the, the tax exemption was promised to be um, tax cost neutral, but it has proven to be to cause a six, $68 million loss in needed revenue for the state. What we're saying is that this revenue if added can benefit HBCUs and resolve the challenges that they face. So on behalf of the NAACP State of State Conference, I encourage the support of Senate Bill 688. Thank you for the opportunity to present. Thank you very much, Senator McRae. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to the bill sponsor and the advocates that's bringing it forward. I know this issue a good bit because I worked extensively on this issue, and um, I could ask a lot of questions around this bill. I'm not going to do that today, uh, but one of the things that I do think is important just to educate the committee on and uh, the bill sponsor is in reference to when you talked about dropping the 11.5% to 8%, what happens is that revenues comes from the Transportation Trust Fund. Each and every person on this committee knows how challenging our tr Transportation Trust Fund is in the dire condition that it's in. Um, but it deals with our buses, it deals with our highway user revenue, it deals with commuter buses, it deals with our Chesapeake Bay. And while it's an admirable uh, response to swing the excise tax over to HBCUs, the reality is, is that we're creating a bigger problem and a compounding problem in reference to our Transportation Trust Fund, who the same population also needs those revenues or, or that help from that, that piece of it. So I guess the question is, have you all thought about the implications of the Transportation Trust Fund for when we drop that uh, sales tax from the rental cars down to 8%? You know what, um, Senator McCray and members of the Budget and Tax Committee, most recently, I had a chance to look at a documentary that was provided um, by NBC, um, and it was one of the less publicized accounts of the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And in that documentary, he talked about, you know, when we wanted voting rights, we, we received resistance. When we wanted, uh, you know, to desegregate restaurants, we received resistance but there will be no greater resistance that we will see when we go for financial assistance. And I will tell you, I, I hear all the importance of the transportation trust fund, but to see young people of color in our HBCUs continuously not have the resources that they so desperately need. If you look at institutions like Coppin State University, where in the last two years, Close to 100 individuals have lost their life either due to nonviolent shootings or tragic homicides. They're, they're, when, one of the first things I learned in, in public policy and, and learning my education at the Frostburg State University was budgets are about priorities. And so, you know, I, I believe, and, and one of the reasons why I bring this bill to you is because I prioritize the life of so many young men and women of color who look forward to an education 
at our historically black colleges and universities and honoring the mission that does those organizations provide in the state of Maryland. Can I ask a follow-up, Mr. Chair? Sure. While I said in, in the beginning, I think that the HBCU cause is a very admirable cause, but dealing with the Transportation Trust Fund, I guess in the bill, my question for you would be, Senator Hayes, why didn't you raise the peer-to-peer -to, -peer to 11 and a half because our Transportation Trust Fund is ultimately uh, affected when we decrease the rental cars down to 8%. So those are folks, the same people that you're talking about, those same people are trying to get the groceries. Those same people are trying to get to prescription drugs. Those same people are trying to get the schools. And when we take that money, it's indirectly impacting the same people that we're trying our best to help. So from a commuter bus standpoint, a highway user revenue standpoint, we know how our jurisdictions are having challenges from a highway user revenue. We know that the Chesapeake Bay has its, its uh, 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 challenges that's going on, but transportation trust fund dollars are what fund those types of things. So I guess the question is, why not raise it to 11.5% versus decreasing uh, the peer-to-peer? -peer? Senator, I, 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 just to respond to that, um, first of all, when you look at the fiscal note, um, it, it, the, the net effect in, in FY23 is $72 million. That's a pretty significant pot of money. Um, we, we will leave it to the wisdom of this committee how to allocate those funds. Um, the bill as originally intended, uh, the beneficiary would be the HBCUs. Uh, I understand that whenever you change taxes, there um, uh, is going to be a ripple effect. And you're, you're very accurately pointing out one of those ripple effects. Uh, but I think the pot of money is large enough that perhaps we could solve that issue and still leave a fairly significant amount of money uh, for HBCUs um, as, as the ultimate beneficiary. But the, your other question about why not just raise it to 11.5% for everybody? Do you know what? I can't, I'm, I may be going out on a limb here. If you get rid of the excise tax exemption and it's a level playing field, maybe that wouldn't be a bad thing. I don't know, I can't say that right here to, you know, that, that that's where we are. But the, the, the critical thing that we're trying to point out with this bill is that you can't claim to have parity if, if we're both paying 11.5%, if one's paying it at the counter and one the other person's is paying it online, if you don't address the, the excise tax issue at the front end. And that's what we're trying to point out. Chris, you was very generous to jump in, but, you know, at uh, the end of the day, right. You know, and Congressman, the late Congressman Cummins said it best, you know, education of our young people is the biggest deterrent to crime, violence, and other things in our community. And at the end of the day, this committee, you know, it, this is a legislative solution that we brought to you, and you all will make the best decisions that you see them fit. But I would just ask in those deliberations that you honor the sacrifices and the importance of educating um, young people at our historically Black colleges and universities. Thank you, Senator. Uh, now on the opposition side, uh, first up is Michael DiLorenzo. Good afternoon, Senators, that's me. I'm a uh, Maryland resident. I run a company called Next Car. We are founded in Maryland by Marylanders, and we're a uh, subsidiary of the Fitzgerald Automall Group. Um, so I have a lot to say. I know I'm going to run out of time, but I gave in uh, two one-pagers um, uh, yesterday for you guys to look at. One of them is a spreadsheet, and one of them is my text. Um, so let's go over the spreadsheet first so everybody can understand how the dollars really work. Um, so if, if you all have that, you can look at uh, line 16, which is the averages of what Maryland residents paid in excise tax in 2020. The source of the data is uh, the Maryland Department of Motor Vehicles website. So on line 15, Column E, the average new car buyer paid $2,225 in tax. Assuming that that buyer keeps that car for five years, which is reasonable, 
they pay $445 a year. That's in column E16. So that new car buyer in Maryland pays $445 a year when they amortize their tax over five years. In column H is the average used car buyer in Maryland in the year 2020. They gross paid 712, but amortized over five years, they're paying $142 in tax per year. And the blended average is in the last column, column I, $236 tax per year. The average rental car is on line 19. According to the uh, Auto Rental News, the average rental car in the United States of America generates $1,031 in revenue per month. Okay, and then taking the math on over to the far right column, that means that the average rental car in Maryland is generating $1,423 in tax per car per year. So now you're comparing apples and apples when you look at it this way. Whether you wanna talk about the new car buyer who pays $445 a year, and how does that compare with $1,423? Obviously the rental cars are paying way more. If you wanna compare it to the used car buyer, the rental cars are paying way more. If you wanna compare it to the average, the rental cars are paying way more. So this theory that rental cars have gotten away with murder and have some unscrupulous tax advantage is just vaporware. This is a California tech company who's selling their wares on the internet that's trying to convince you to give them a tax advantage so when they go public later this year, they have something to sell in the marketplace. So there's way more to this than anything that anybody else is bringing up. So I was there in 1993 and I worked with uh, the chairman of this committee, Senator Larry Levitan at the time. And he assigned me to work with the vice chair, Senator Bill, um, shoot, I forgot his name. Damn it, I hate that. Anyway, um, Amos, Senator Bill Amos, um, to, to work this out in the industry. I'm a Maryland operator doing business in Maryland. The only people that pay excise tax are companies that are domiciled in Maryland. You'll find back then all the companies were domiciled at Washington National Airport. So nobody was registering cars in Maryland. They, when you went to BWI Airport, the entire fleet of cars in the parking lot had Virginia tags on it. So things have changed a lot. Now, the point I'm trying to make here is if you switch back to uh, excise tax instead of taxing the rental transaction, you're gonna shrink the pool of cars that are being taxed. Right now, when a um, Turo host from Washington, D.C., where most of the cars are garaged right now, brings his car into Maryland and rents it to a Maryland citizen, you're taxing that transaction and you're collecting tax. Under the proposal we have now, you're not going to get that tax because the D.C. resident doesn't pay any Maryland excise tax. Mr. DeLorenzo, you need to wrap up, please. They're still entitled to rent cars in Maryland. So, you need to explore the entire interstate commerce rules called proportional registration to understand just how complicated this matter gets. Uh, and I'll rest Thank now and you could have the floor. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, I think we're well aware of how complicated this issue is from last year. And I guess I'm a little, um, Disappointed that we're not, it doesn't, in some ways, doesn't feel like we're much further along. However, um, which, which just suggests to me that, you know, of course, after all the good work of Senator McCray last year, I'm going to have to probably assign him again to, to a group to get this finally settled because we're not going to deal this again next year. We're just not. Um, and um, I, um, We'll go through that and, and, and I point that out that to those to the remaining, I should have said this at the very beginning, but didn't quite know the depth of the 
situation when we started this bill. But uh, with those who are going to continue, know that this is going to be in a work group. So just as a point of um, information to everyone. Rob Gargiola. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Rob Gargiola with Compass Government Relations, uh, testifying on behalf of both Enterprise Rent-A-Car and uh, Nextcar, uh, Fitz uh, Auto a company. Um, appreciate the objectives uh, and have reached out to Senator McRae about them with respect to HBCUs um, uh, and appreciate all the effort that uh, Senator McRae uh, put into this issue and many of you uh, as well last year and, and in the interim leading up to this year. I look forward to certainly working with you uh, to address this issue. I know we have um, Senator Quarterman, new to the committee, and, and Senator Young, who's not new to the Senate, but uh, new to this issue. This is, as you can gather, a longstanding issue. Uh, what I'd like to emphasize is that right now today, you can use your phone to get an enterprise rental car or a next car or a Turo or a get around. It's all the same with respect to how you would, as a consumer, as a customer, get a vehicle that you need, whether it's for vacation travel or just to travel around the state. Um, and in fact, about three years ago, the Maryland General Assembly uh, enacted legislation to regulate, to have the same insurance requirements applied to both rental cars in the traditional sense, as well as, you know, kind of app oriented, uh, you know, car sharing like Turo, Get Around, and other companies. The difference is, how they're taxed. But otherwise, from the consumer's standpoint, whether they're flying into BWI airport from Oklahoma or they're a Marylander renting a car or a Turo, um, right now there's a competitive disadvantage for companies like Enterprise or local businesses like Nextcar uh, based here in Maryland. The consumer at the end of the day is paying less sales taxes uh, when they're dealing with uh, car sharing uh, apps like Turo and Get Around than they are with Enterprise, uh, Next Car, and other rental car companies, which are providing hundreds of jobs in the state of Maryland. Now, I appreciate uh, and I, I appreciate the point of bringing parity on the sales tax. Um, I think the excise tax parity is misguided. There are a number of reasons for that, but the, ultimately, when you're dealing with a business you don't tax the product as it's moving through kind of chain of commerce to the end user. I mean, it'd be like saying that all of the parts that Verizon uh, used to make this phone paid the sales tax on all those parts and then turned around and charged the sales tax required by the state to the end user. You just don't do that in a business. Uh, and you wouldn't do that with respect to a rental car business with respect to the excise tax, which is why it's exempted. For the person who has a car sharing business, if I had a vehicle that I wanted to share with others, I can deduct those expenses. If I had a home office that I was using for that business, I could deduct that expense if I were renting my car or two cars or three cars or four cars. So there, there are deductions on all your sides own. of the equation. Your, your, your time is up. If I, if I can include Mr. Chair, we look forward sure. to working with the committee uh, to get tax parity uh, for, for both of these industries. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Andy Doloff. Yeah. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. And you said the last name right. That's always a tricky one. So appreciate that. <laughs> um, you know, I'm Andy Doloff. I'm the vice president, general manager of Enterprise Holdings. We represent Enterprise Alamo National. I cover the majority of the state of Maryland, uh, as well as BWI, which is kind of the the epicenter for, for a lot of car rental activity here in the state of Maryland. We're really proud. I know Chris asked about our involvement with HBCUs. We're really proud of what we do in the state of Maryland. We employ 1,800 Marylanders. Our payroll is about $91 million in the state of Maryland. And we hire a lot of recent Maryland college graduates, including several from the HBCUs here in the state of Maryland. Uh, we also gave back about $1.4 million to the state of Maryland, and I can get you the exact figures on how uh, involved we are with the HBCUs if the committee uh, would like. Um, I say all those things uh, just to say that we are a good Maryland business, and the idea or the notion that you could all of a sudden repeal the inventory tax 
that every other state has out there. Um, and, and Rob went through kind of the process of commerce uh, and it wouldn't impact us. It would absolutely decimate the car oil industry that gives back about $167 million in direct activity back to the state. So the, this large fiscal note would be absolutely detrimental to the car rental business and the business that I run here in the state of Maryland. So I am excited about the parity issue. That's really been the, the genesis of the argument forever is all we want is everybody who rents a car in the state of Maryland that the consumer pays the same tax at the end of the day. That's all we've been asking for since this started. I'm glad we're no longer debating if they're a rental car company or not a rental car company or what, what they're considered. They're renting a car to the customer at the end of the day, uh, and we want them to pay at the same tax. Uh, Rob went through uh, the way customers sort vehicles. We're all housed in the same house at BWI Airport. All the rental car companies pay the same transportation fees, busing fees, concession fees, state taxes. And you actually go to the same house to get the car. If you didn't, if any company had a significant advantage on where they rented the car, it would be, it would be preposterous to think that another uh, car rental agency wouldn't take off in terms of their growth. That's why there's a consolidated center where everybody pays the same taxes and fees. So uh, obviously we're opposed to the bill. Uh, I'm glad uh, somebody from Turo found a, an accountant in Oregon that made a, made a, uh, a point in August, but these states all have the same uh, state tax rules. And it's important that we keep the tax rules in place. And all we need is to move the peer to peer operators to tax parity at 11 and a half percent and the mission would be accomplished in my mind. So we oppose the bill vehemently here at Enterprise. Thank, thank you very much. We'll go Hanson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Mike Johansson on behalf of Enterprise. Mike DiLorenzo and I are the gray haired people that were part of the rental car coalition back in the early 90s. He was the client and I was the counsel. So we can have a history discussion, but it's completely irrelevant to where we are today. I'll take your guidance, Mr. Chairman. Here's a solution. Chris DiPietro from Turo was the one to half of it. 11 and a half percent for everybody because that's what the customers pay. The guy who's flying into Oklahoma should pay the same tax. And remember, he's the one paying it. So it's exported back to Oklahoma. So all that BWI traffic should pay the same rate, 11 and a half, and it should apply statewide. For people that are in the business of renting cars, and that's defined in the current Maryland law that you have to have a fleet of five or more, they should all get the same excise tax exemption, whether they put their cars on a platform or they put them on enterprise. Actually, that language is already in the statute and that's the way it should be. For someone who's an occasional, um, put, you know, their single car on a car sharing platform, if you wanna create a credit system for them, give them 3% or 3.5% um, vendor discount off of the 11.5% that the customer owes, gets processed in real time, and the person who has the onesie twosie car that goes on the car sharing platform gets a little bit of a vendor discount. Complete parity, business people engage, get the same inventory tax exemption, the customer pays the same. And Mr. Chairman, if we could draft up the amendments, we'll have them ready for your committee's consideration. Thank, thank you very much. Any questions or anyone who's testified on this? Okay, thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Senate you. Bill 566, Senator Alfreth, Anne Arundel County Transfer Tax. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, Senator Sarah Elfreth representing Maryland's 30th District. I'm here with my county executive. This is a, a, a bill by request of, of the county executive, but it solves an issue that I, I know that we all care about very deeply, which is addressing affordable <laughs> housing and closing this gap on, on housing uh, disparities and affordability that we have throughout the state, but particularly here in Anne Arundel County. Uh, where not everybody can afford to live where they work. And we have a lot of families, particularly because of this pandemic, who are struggling to keep a roof over their heads and are trying their best to be able to afford uh, housing here in the county, but, but simply can't. This is a policy solution that I, I agree with, and I want to thank my county executive and the folks who've worked diligently over the years on this issue to, to bring us this solution. So with that, Mr. Chair, happy to answer questions, or the county executive, I believe, is prepared to go through the bill. Yeah. Thank you very much, Senator. Uh, 
Mr. Executive, it's good to see you. I am very grateful for you um, as someone who continues to come out and uh, voice your interest on what you uh, want for your own uh, jurisdiction. So I'm pleased to see you. Um, certainly look forward to hearing what you have to say. And I am, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, excellent. Good. I thought I might have to change my mic. <laughs> um, so thank you. And thank you, uh, Senator Elford, for, for um, bringing this bill forward. Uh, it's true that in Anne Arundel County, like most of our counties in Maryland, certainly in Central Maryland, we have a, an affordable uh, housing affordability crisis. We have 50% um, of our low and moderate income renters that are cost burdened, paying more than 30% of their income on rent, and 21% of those same people severely cost burdened, paying more than half of their income on rent. And our Chamber of Commerce, and really many in our development community who are participating in our affordable housing coalition, have encouraged the county to do more. Um, in fact, um, back in the fall of 18, we were under threat of lawsuits by a coalition of organizations that said that we were in violation of the Fair Housing Act because so little had been done in our county to promote and encourage affordable housing. So when I came in, we had a four, four, four pieces of legislation, a workforce housing bill, a fair housing bill, both of those passed our council, and then two more coming, a, a housing trust fund and moderately priced dwelling unit uh, set aside for developers. In order to do the housing trust fund, which is really the linchpin of it, we need this authority from the state uh, to be able to create a funding mechanism. And the funding me mechanism, as you see here, um, is the authority to do an increase of our transfer tax uh, on properties valued at over a million dollars. So uh, the, um, the transfer tax in Anne Arundel County is 1% now. Um, our neighbors, our surrounding neighbors are higher. Prince George's is 1.4, Baltimore City, Baltimore County are both 1.5. We have the authority to raise that for everybody, but you know, in, in, in these economic times, uh, we know that the average homeowner uh, is already burdened um, and the smaller businesses are already burdened. So we want to be able to have the authority to only do it for the properties over a million dollars. The, um, the, the opposition you'll hear from, I'm sure, um, is, has said that, well, taxes are already too high. We're already paying too much. We're all burdened. Um, but when you really look at what's been going on recently, uh, the CARES Act had $135 billion tax break for real estate folks in it. The corporate tax rate was cut by 30% for corporations in the country in 2017. And the real estate industry has been doing quite well in this pandemic. Prices are going up. Lots of properties are being sold. Uh, so we actually think that they'll benefit some of these larger operators um, by having a housing trust fund because this money will be used to help close the deals that those, those who are working on affordable housing are having the pipeline. And, uh, and we think that it'll be good for, for everybody in our county. But again, it's, it's simply authorizing the county council to make these decisions. And, um, and we hope that you will give it a favorable review. Thank you, Mr. Executive. Uh, Ryan Sermons. Yes, hello. Um, thank you. My name is uh, Reverend Ryan Sermons. I'm the lead organizer of Anne Arundel Connecting Together, or ACT. Uh, ACT represents 26 faith, nonprofit, and small business organizations across Anne Arundel County. Uh, we are part of a larger Metro IAF network that includes affiliates in Baltimore City, Howard County, Montgomery County, and as of last night, Prince George's County. When ACT launched in 2018, we listened to over 4,000 households in the county around various concerns. At the top of many people's lists were housing affordability. In 2019, we packed into historic Mother Asbury United Methodist Church in downtown Annapolis to demand of Anne Arundel County a host of housing reforms that answered the needs of the people we had heard. Senate Bill 566 represents one of those demands, an integral part of those demands, to which our county leaders, including uh, County Executive Pittman, supported. One of our leaders, Dominique Scurry, represents this demand, personifies it. I talked with her this morning. As a single uh, working parent, she expressed being stuck in a subsidized housing complex and even getting a raise raises her rents. She doesn't want to be stuck. She wants to get to a house she owns, a house she can improve, and free up housing such as where she is now, which was always supposed to be temporary. Now with her and both of her sons working, thanks be to God, they could, nonetheless, find themselves paying nearly $1,700 to 
and the subsidized rental that could be going toward a mortgage. A lifeline, such as the housing trust fund that 7 SB 566 represents, is more cost-effective for her as it seems to be cheaper than subsidizing rent while getting her in a secure place to take care of her and her family. Again, her story is similar to hundreds, if not thousands, of stories we heard across this county. Act urges a favorable report to 566. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kathleen Cott. Good afternoon, Chairman and members of the committee. Um, just uh, corrected, Kathleen Coke, like the drink. No, oh, um, sorry. <laughs> I'll say like the drink, not the drug. Um, so, okay, I'm Kathleen Koch. I'm the director for Arundel Community Development Services, which is Anne Arundel County's Housing and Community Development Agency. And I thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of Senate Bill 566. Um, as you know, this is an enabling legislation that will allow the county to enact legislation to establish a housing trust fund to address the need for affordable housing in our county. And as you already have heard, the need for housing that's affordable to households, especially households at 80% and below the median income is great. It's extremely dire when you look at households at 50% and below. And I think this point is especially so when you look at the number of households on our waiting list for rental assistance. There are 23,800 households waiting for rental assistance in Anne Arundel County. So the funds available through this special revenue fund will enable us to leverage other federal and state funds, enabling us to make a dent and move toward addressing this issue. The need for additional funds is evident by the fact that we, in concert with the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development, are only able to fund less than 50% of the affordable rental developments requiring or needing gap funding in order to make their projects financially feasible. So we, um, we urge you to support Senate Bill 566 as it will give the county the ability to meet this ever increasing need for affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tony Pratt. Hello, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Fine. So my name is Tony Pratt. I'm the um, owner and CEO of People Builders Consulting and I'm also a Mac member of ACT and Arundel Connecting Together. I'm supporting Bill SB 566, and I hope by the end of my testimony, you will also support this bill for a housing trust for affordable housing. So I'm the product of being able to use, um, utilize a housing trust that's set up sort of like this in the city of Annapolis. I've lived here all of my life, did thought my dream of owning here was far out of reach until, be, until I landed in uh, lease to purchase property. Um, got to the portion where I could build, got to the portion, the position where I could own a home and closing costs kept it out of reach. But because of the possible trust that they have in the city of Annapolis, I was able to get closing costs to be able to now be a homeowner in the city of Annapolis. This trust is so needed for people like me to be able to not only um, live here all their lives and raise children here and contribute to the wealth of this city and county and state, but to actually be able to live in Annapolis in the high priced places in Anne Arundel County in Maryland that sometimes keep us from reaching our dreams and destiny. So I would ask you because of this to support Bill SB 55 because people like me are coming behind me and we would not only like to work here, but also live where we work at. So thank you. Thank you very much. Trudy McFall. Good, hi there. I don't see me on the screen. Do you see me on the screen? We, we see you perfectly. All right, good afternoon. Thank you. Um, I'm Trudy McFall and uh, I'm here to um, urge you to uh, vote favorably for this bill. I'm here today with uh, wearing mostly my hat as the incoming chairman of the Anne Arundel Affordable Housing Coalition, which is a hundred or so folks all very active in the affordable housing community from uh, owners, investors, citizens, residents, and advocates. Um, and indeed, um, 
Actually, let me say, let me use one of my precious seconds to say what a treat to have a chance to say thank you to our county executive who has indeed come into office and done so many of the things uh, with the able assistance of Kathy Koch and her staff uh, to increase new opportunities for affordable housing. And so this is another uh, next step that is, is much needed and appreciated. Um, I will be extremely brief. You've heard the data from the experts. Uh, the need, I think, for affordable housing in the county is apparent. They're making a lot of progress, but there's still a tremendous amount of unmet needs. And uh, I am also the chairman and founder of Homes for America, which is a nonprofit affordable housing developer. And I can tell you that the gaps in funding and resources able to make projects viable and possible for serving the lower income people are, are very scarce and difficulty. So anything we can do to add to the um, gap funding financing and create flexible uh, resources that bridge a, a lot of gaps from the kind of home ownership that um, dear Tony was talking about to the um, creation of new affordable housing. So we strongly support it. There's one other thing that I think is, should, is important to the county and um, I hope to the achievement of their comprehensive plan and their goals is that the more a local jurisdiction has some gap financing that they can put into projects that are proposed, the more they're going to have success at the state government in influencing the state's uh, selection of communities to meet the local needs. And um, so there's many good benefits of, of a, a trust fund bill that can help um, the affordable housing needs. And we hope you will enact it and look forward to working with the county council to implement it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that uh, concludes the uh, favorable group. Is there anyone who would like to ask those folks a question? If not, then uh, Tom Ballantyne. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee. My name is Tom Ballantyne. I'm the Vice President for Policy for NAOP, Maryland. We're a commercial real estate trade association. Um, and here, uh, respectfully, in the opposition, I'd like to make a, a, a few points that are higher level and then to the bill if if, there, if time allows. And we're, uh, we represent some of the largest property owners in Anne Arundel County and in this region. And the, the, the ask for a trust fund and a tax to fund it, um, we think is, is part of a much more complex set of, of factors that are eroding affordability um, in the Baltimore region. And we're concerned long-term that that the combination of taxes, land use policy, and housing affordability are going to continue to um, become a problem for traffic, uh, transportation, environment, and, and for business formation. In the, in the DC region, they've begun to accept that there is a problem. And if you use the same math in the Baltimore region, the problem is as bad or worse in terms of underbuild of, of, uh, of housing. The, the trust fund idea puts a, a surcharge without limit on high value transactions. That means that commercial transactions will be hit hard by that. And we have concerns about that for a number of reasons. The, if you go back to 2019, the last year where we had you know, pre-COVID data, um, the largest single segment of commercial transactions were apartment buildings. 5% of the, of the transactions were raw land. So that is potentially stacking taxes during the land development process, not things that help with affordability. Um, the, the, the stacking of taxes and is, a, is a problem on the, the recordation tax and other, other kinds of, of excise taxes. And we think that generally the state has begun to rely too heavily on, on excise taxes and impact fees and commercial real estate taxes um, over the last 10 years in Anne Arundel and some of the other central Maryland counties, it's the, it's the commercial real estate tax base that's grown and backfilled either flat or declining values in, the, in residential. We don't think that's going to happen going forward. I mean, there are parts of, of the commercial real estate uh, um, industry that have responded fairly well during COVID. I, I point out uh, uh, industrial warehouse distribution for that. But there are also parts that are getting. Ballantyne, if you could wrap up, please. 
Um, I would also just point out to you, there are, we do have some technical concerns that I've outlined in the letter. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Ballantyne. Okay, that concludes the hearing on that bill. Next up is Senate Bill 630. I'm pleased to see the president here, President Ferguson. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, would you like me to jump right in? Absolutely. My first bill hearing of the year. So uh, I'm, I'm not, we're, we're not experts like we're you honored. are. Um, yeah. So uh, I will, this is a pretty simple bill, Senate Bill 630, um, but I'm gonna give a little bit of context. At the, end, at the end of the day, this is a funding bill, but um, I wanna kind of give the context of, of why it's here. Um, I first learned of adult high schools through the, uh, the Baltimore Metropolitan Council sponsored a HUD grant uh, called the Opportunity Collaborative. And um, most of us have heard of GEDs and other types of the, uh, the alternative diploma programs that exist in Maryland and have done really great things. Uh, that said, uh, there is a separate model that is the adult high school model that really is much more about a recovery, a credit recovery. So the vast majority of those individuals who have dropped out of high school have accumulated some level of credit prior to dropping out. Um, the difference with the adult high school program is that it is a content base and it is much easier for adult learners to meet that bar of earning an actual high school diploma in the state of Maryland. Additionally, the most successful adult high school programs are ones that are tied to workforce development and job placement opportunities embedded as part of the learning and instruction. Uh, the best example out there is actually out is in Indiana. So who would have thought, but Indiana had the very first Excel Center sponsored by Goodwill National, Goodwill Industries National. It has had unbelievable results in putting um, individuals changing the trajectory of their life. And we know that the economic impacts are enormous. It's roughly at least $7,000 a year uh, is the difference between a high school diploma and not. And I think the thing that got me most passionate about this is that in the state of Maryland, an educated state uh, like we have in the state of Maryland, 25% of our population over the age of 18 does not have a high school diploma. To me, that is a remarkable statistic. Uh, and so as we sort of think about what recovery looks like, um, I think, figuring out how we can make sure that these programs are viable is essential. So back in 2015, we did a work group to study this. How could we bring this to Maryland? In 2017, after two years of a work group, we put forward a pilot program that allowed for the application of six adult high schools in the state of Maryland. Two years ago, and you'll hear from um, Elevate and, and some incredible uh, community members that have been working on this project uh, in Baltimore City, but it's not the only one. Uh, these, there were two applicants for uh, two of these six slots. Uh, two, both applicants were awarded the license to operate an adult high school, the first adult high school in Maryland. Uh, the challenge has been the startup. Um, we are not talking about uh, a wealthy community that can uh, afford to pay tuition for an adult high school re uh, diploma recovery program. We are talking about individuals who are seeking to really change the, the trajectory of their earning potential. Uh, that said, it's those initial startup dollars that have been incredibly difficult to acquire. And so this bill uh, provides initial funding for these uh, two pilot programs to be able to launch, um, uh, one of which has an identified site and is ready to go. And we were hoping was going to be able to open, uh, but the pandemic hit. And so now it's been a bit more of a struggle. Uh, with these dollars, we will be able to, to, to launch the first adult high school and then hopefully replicate it across the state to get to that 25% of, of Marylanders who, who who are uh, living without a diploma and, and making ends meet. Uh, with that, would urge a favorable report on the bill and appreciate the committee's attention. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, question for the president. Okay, uh, Mike Kelly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Mike Kelly. I'm the executive director of the Baltimore Metropolitan Council. And as the Senate president mentioned, um, this. Uh, the concept uh, was one of the things we looked at during a program called the Opportunity Collaborative, where we looked at housing, workforce, and transportation issues um, across the Baltimore region. Um, since that time of 2012, uh, BMC has really gotten into workforce development policy, supporting our local workforce boards uh, and helping them sort of run the numbers to try and figure out uh, the, the best programs to implement. And, I, and I'm going to focus on a couple of those numbers today. Um, what we do is essentially identify the barriers that job seekers face, um, and then we look at the labor market and see what we can, what solutions we can propose to help 
people overcome those barriers to, to move up in the labor market. And for people without a high school diploma, um, the number one barrier they cite is, is simply not having that diploma. This degree, um, the, the diploma, as far as educational credentials go, is the linchpin for families at or near the poverty line. So 90% of people without a high school diploma say that's their number one barrier. Beyond that, 61% say they can't find a job that covers the cost of living. 54% uh, say they can't get training because the cost of education is too high, as, as Senate President Gibson mentioned. And 50% say they simply don't know where to get the training. So the opportunity to simply finish a high school diploma, to, to complete something that was already started and for whatever reasons life threw at you, you couldn't complete, is, is a game changer for a lot of these families. Um, the other thing we look at in the labor market are what we've deemed to be family supporting jobs. And these are jobs that pay a wage of $22.28 an hour to people without a bachelor's degree. Um, these jobs only represent about 14% of our job market. It's a really tiny sliver of jobs out there that pay this wage to somebody who hasn't had the opportunity to go to college. And when you dig down into that 14%, this, this relatively small share of, of good paying, relatively low skill jobs, 74% of those jobs require a diploma. So the, the high school diploma is not the, it's not the end result of someone's educational journey. It's not the stopping point. But for families looking to pull themselves out of poverty, for families looking to find economic stability, it, it is the single most critical step you can take. Um, as, as Senator Ferguson mentioned, it, these programs are flexible. Um, they work with adults. They work with people who, for whatever reason, couldn't complete that diploma. There was obviously challenges there. And, and nationally, these programs have a great track work record of making the, the educational program work for the learner. Um, and finally, in the long run, um, you know, the, the relatively low startup cost here compared to the cost of the state and of, of government supporting a family in poverty, it, it's, it's a sound investment. It's the, it's the right kind of investment to be making. It's the right kind of investment to empower largely young adults um, trying to, to get a jump start on their lives after some hiccups. So with that, I'll end my testimony. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Diane Phillips, Philip. You know, I apologize. I think I skipped everyone. Um, Alexandria Warwick Adams, I apologize. No worries, no worries. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Ch Chair and honorable committee members. My name is Alexandria Warwick Adams. I am the executive director of Elevate Baltimore. We are a full service community school um, nonprofit organization that partners with schools, families, and the community to ensure that every student is um, prepared for high school, college, career, and life. Um, we are the operator of the South Baltimore Adult High School. Um, we're here in support of Senate Bill. Uh, 630. It is critically important to us that um, this uh, initial funding stream at the state level is enacted in order to make this third opportunity for um, pathway to success for Maryland, Marylanders um, successful. Um, key components of the program, um, as Senator Ferguson, Senate President Ferguson um, outlined, is that it does um, allow participants to receive high school credit post-secondary credit, industry credentialed certification, and um, provides individualized services. I really wanted to pause for a moment to highlight the importance of these individualized services. This is a key component of both the program as well as our application. I have had the opportunity to speak with um, many of those that are interested in the particular program, and the prevailing thought is a gratitude around the option of a program that will work with the entire person and not just really think about them as an academic data point that the state is trying to move forward. Um, the South Baltimore Adult High School will also is also conceptualized as the first adult high school community school model in the country and is based on the needs of the learner. Such services include, but not limited to childcare, transportation, housing referrals, mental health services, crisis intervention, substance abuse treatment, um, and then all kinds of legal aid services. Um, as Senator Ferguson highlighted, um, there are adult high school models throughout the country, including Washington State, Indiana, and in our backyard, DC. 
Um, the estate authorizes the uh, adult high school program. It is jointly authorized by the Department of Labor and the State Department of Education. Uh, a couple of key services um, that we really wanted to highlight about the program is that it does really take into account college and career readiness standards. Academic remediation, we know that um, students that are coming to us um, have had a lot of challenges and may need various accommodations. So programs are prepared to meet those accommodations. Um, our program is a partnership um, and uh, we really enjoy talking about this partnership between Elevate Baltimore, Baltimore City Community College and the Cherry Hill Development Corporation. As many of you know, and has been highlighted in um, a variety of uh, different uh, circumstances, uh, it is critically important to invest in programs that look at look to advance outcomes for those that have been most impacted by un the unintended consequences of systematic racism and redlining. For the adult high school program located in Cherry Hill, this is no exception. The lack of state investment has stalled the progress of this innovative program, and is that so desperately needed. With investments, recent investments from philanthropy and the adoption of the program by Baltimore City as a demonstration model to advance the outcomes for Baltimore City residents, um, the addition of dedicated state funding will allow this program to see its full potential. We urge the committee to vote favorably um, in support of this bill. Um, I'm happy to take any questions um, or, uh, or field any um, comments about uh, the program. Thank you, uh, Ms. Warwick Adams. I apologize again um, for jumping over you. I think I must be nervous with the president here. Um, next up, uh, Diana Phil. She never came in, Senator. Okay. Uh, Karen uh, York. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. For the record, I'm Karen York, CEO of the Job Opportunities Task Force, and I am here in support of Senate Bill 630 as a means of ensuring that lower income adult workers, job seekers, and particularly formerly incarcerated persons have access to adult education services that will enable them to advance in the workforce. JOTF's mission is to help low wage workers advance to high wage jobs. Our core constituency is usually relegated to the low wage worker category due to education and employment barriers. These barriers typically include access and affordability to training, community college, and more, transportation, a criminal record, and or meeting the requirements of court mandated rulings that make it very difficult for individuals to participate in stable employment. JOTF also runs a pre-apprenticeship construction training program and the community bail fund for Baltimore City. And we find that across the board, a key barrier is credentialing. While we partner with South Baltimore Learning Center for those who are in need of supports, we find that for many individuals, there's no way that they're gonna be able to move forward without this important credentialing um, that is wrapped with all of, wrapped around all the many other supports that will ensure their success. And so we know as many of the panelists and as Senator Ferguson has indicated that in, the, in today's job market, a high school diploma or equivalency is a necessary qualification, particularly for those low wage workers that are moving towards a higher paid uh, position. Um, in 2017, JOTF supported the approved legislation that ultimately redefined adult education in the state labor statute as pertaining to individuals who are over the age of 16 and not currently enrolled in or required to be enrolled in what we call our traditional high schools. The lack of a high school credential or equivalency restricts opportunities for further education and training for competitiveness and pursuing the region's middle skill jobs and many times unnecessarily. Moreover, the average reading level of the 19,332 incarcerated citizens in the Maryland prison system is between fifth and eighth grade. Less than half of this population had a high school diploma when they entered the system. And studies have shown that recidivism rates for incarcerated persons with a high school diploma and or GED or college degree are 7.9% less than the overall imprisoned population. While in, this, while in September, the Maryland Department of Labor provided $16.8 million in combined state and federal funding to 25 publicly funded adult education providers, the majority were community colleges, though JOTF was extremely pleased to see South Baltimore Learning Center supported. Senate Bill 630 seeks to build on the initial efforts in 2017 and recent efforts by establishing the grant funding for private nonprofit organizations that provide these critical services. 
these appropriations are an important next step in, re in reducing recidivism and increasing employment opportunities for our low income workers and job seekers in Maryland, particularly those that have interacted with the criminal justice system. For these reasons, JOTF urges a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions for the president or his witnesses? Okay, thank you very much. We'll move on to Senate Bill 787, Digital Advertising Gross Revenue Tax Exemption and Restriction. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. It is a pleasure to be here again with you for the second bill hearing of uh, the session. Um, this is a bill that uh, is related to one that you all know very well. Uh, this is the digital advertising tax bill that was over, the veto was overturned last week. Um, what this bill is, is a cleanup bill. Um, and there are three specific components and there is an amendment incorporated uh, to, so that members are aware. Um, and I'll just go through each of the different pieces. So I think everyone is, is well aware of what the underlying bill of the digital ad tax is. Uh, we had uh, extended debate on that last week. Um, while I still am uh, rather uh, disbelieving that there is a way to pass through uh, any gross receipts tax costs to specific advertisers, um, from the beginning, it was very clear that the goal of this uh, assessment on gross receipts uh, was focused on these platforms that are brand new in the last 20 years and that have evaded every single taxation method in the state of Maryland. Um, and so what we wanted to do is take a, boot, uh, a belt and suspenders approach um, and make it uh, objectively obvious that they, the gross receipts tax could not be passed down to those seeking to advertise on these, these multinational, multi-billion dollar platforms. Um, and so there is a, uh, a, pr a prohibition for those who are assessed uh, from passing along any costs associated through a surcharge fee or line item on an advertiser's bill. Um, this is a, 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 a further protection um, that while uh, may have been unlikely that it was necessary in the first place, we want to be extra sure that it does not have any pass down impact because this is a gross receipts tax on the apportioned revenue that the companies, these platforms derive. Uh, it is not a sales tax on the transaction. Um, so that is amendment, or that is the first part of the bill. The second part of the bill was the unintentional in incorporation of broadcast and news media. Uh, that was never the intent on the bill as it passed last year. Um, and over the interim, we had learned that the language could capture some of the uh, newspapers and, and media broadcast companies. Um, and so we uh, affirmatively want to make sure that they are excluded uh, from the provisions of this assessment. Uh, this is really a, a public policy basis. Uh, I think we all understand how important the news media is these days now more than ever. Um, and it is important for them to be financially sustainable uh, as well. Uh, and, and the First Amendment implications of freedom of the press were something that we never intended to impact on the front end. And so this is a cleanup to ensure that they are exempted um, from any provisions of the bill. The third uh, component makes the bill an emergency bill. Uh, so that it can be uh, in effect immediately uh, as this uh, as the underlying legislation has now been overridden uh, and will be active in 26 days. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you members of the committee would urge a favorable report and uh, open to any questions that the committee may have. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Timothy Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I hope you can hear me okay. And thank you for the opportunity to testify today regarding Senate Bill 787. My name's Tim Nelson. I serve as counsel to the Maryland DC Delaware Broadcasters Association. The association and its members, which number approximately 35 TV stations and 175 radio stations, enthusiastically support Senate Bill 787 and we hope the committee will report it favorably. As Senator Ferguson just mentioned, Maryland's broadcasters and other news media entities like newspapers were never the intended targets of House Bill 732's digital advertising tax legislation. But as the Senator just mentioned, many broadcasters would in fact be directly subject to the digital ad tax as it's written. We thank Senator Ferguson for sponsoring Senate Bill 787 and recognizing this unintended consequence. The bill remedies that consequence by exempting from the ad tax those ads that appear on digital interfaces, websites, apps, and the like, owned or operated by a broadcast entity or a news media entity as defined in the legislation. And pursuant to what President Ferguson just said, the bill really recognizes, in our view, the importance and value uh, of objective, accurate, trusted local journalism here in Maryland and the critical need for that journalism uh, perhaps now more than ever, as people turn to the local media outlets for critical information during this uh, 
what I'll call double whammy of the pandemic during an uh, economic downturn. Uh, in addition to providing news and weather and health and emergency information, both on air and online, um, the MDCD's member stations air countless hours of free public service announcements. We participate in and sponsor events from food drives to telethons that you know, lift up the very communities in which our employees live and work. Um, but make no mistake, broadcasters and of course newspapers face significant competitive and financial challenges. Producing high quality, local trusted news and journalism is expensive. Uh, our TV stations and radio stations provide over the air services free to the public. We fund our on air and digital operations through advertising. Advertising is really the only source of revenue for radio and it's a primary source of revenue for local TV stations. That ad revenue, however, has been declining for years. And as you might imagine, that's in large part because of the dominance of a handful of giant digital platforms that have come into the advertising marketplace, big tech companies. Advertisers and critical revenue have been diverted away from broadcasters and news media that produce local journalism as a result. So subjecting broadcasters to the digital ad tax would ultimately hurt us more and lead to less of the local journalism on which the public depends. With that in mind, Senate Bill 787 aims to prevent that, to stem the tide a little. My association thanks you for consideration of the bill and urges the committee to report it favorably, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Rebecca Schneider. Good afternoon, committee. Uh, I, for the record, am Rebecca Snyder, Executive Director of the Maryland Delaware DC Press Association, and we are delighted to support Senate Bill 787. Um, this bill addresses the problems inherent in House Bill uh, 732 by exempting news media, including newspapers, news websites, and broadcasters from paying the digital advertising tax. This exemption really does, as Tim said, acknowledge the vital importance of Maryland's local news outlets in providing news and commentary to our communities. And we appreciate Senator Ferguson's recognition of the importance of local news gathering and in understanding the role of digital advertising revenue in supporting that news revenue, that, that news reporting, excuse me. Our members connect communities by reporting on issues of public interest, supporting public service programs, and through connecting advertisers. By shining light on hidden problems, our members provide opportunities for change and reflection through investigative reporting. Now, Tim spoke about the critical work that local news media has done during the pandemic and the before times and the dire economic state um, faced by many of our members as by many Marylanders. However, I want to focus on the idea that news media and broadcast entities should be exempt from the tax. The language of this bill is tailored and narrow, and it focuses on entities that are engaged primarily in the business of news gathering, reporting or publishing in the public interest. It further clarifies that aggregators and third party republishers do not qualify for this exemption. The freedom of the press is specifically called out in the constitution within the first amendment. In the words of Supreme Court uh, Justice Potter Stewart, freedom of the press is no constitutional accident, but an acknowledgement of the critical role played by the press in American society. The constitution requires sensitivity to that role and to the special needs of the press in performing it effectively. Maryland has further recognized the unique role of the press by passing laws that facilitate and protect journalism as do many other states, we're not alone here. For instance, Maryland has one of the oldest shield laws in the country, and that shield law protects journalists from disclosing their sources. So these protections are an important piece of the puzzle and encourage a free press. SB 787 continues this tradition of protecting news media's role in our society and recognizing the value of journalism, and we urge a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sean Looney. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Sean Looney from Comcast. Um, we spent a lot of time on this issue last year, many hours in budget and taxation committee. And uh, so the conversation continues. Um, we understand, at, at least my interpretation upon introduction was that this bill was targeted at online digital interactive advertising. And certainly that raised a lot of concerns related to privacy, et cetera. 
And so um, we looked at this new bill and the, this now exemption for broadcast TV, and we're res we respectfully requesting an amendment that would expand that exemption to include all television advertising. And the problem is it's a fairness and discrimination issue at this point, because think of it this way, if you're watching TV at night and you're watching a broadcast TV news program and you see a Toyota ad, that advertising is not being taxed. If you change the channel and go to the tennis channel, for example, because I like watching the Australian Open right now, um, any advertising on that channel would be taxed. So to keep it simple, to keep it fair, to keep it non-discriminatory, we're just requesting that this exemption for broadcast TV advertising be expanded to include all TV advertising. Um, and, and as far as the benefit for you know, the, the small business person, and Delegate Eckerd knows this better than anyone, you know, Ocean City all summer, if you turn on the TV set, it's local cable TV advertising for the restaurants, the hotels, the bars, et cetera. And so anything we can do to help, you know, those people that are advertising that way, I think would be helpful too. So that's why we respectfully request this amendment. We hope that the sponsor will treat it as a friendly amendment. It's just meant to clarify, not discriminate and keep it fair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sarah Price. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. President, Chairman, and Honorable Members of the Committee. My name is Sarah Price, and I'm here on behalf of the Maryland Retailers Association. It is no secret that the retail industry opposed the digital advertising tax and supported Governor Hogan's veto of last year's bill. There is great concern in the industry about the cost that the cost of the tax will get passed down to the small businesses that rely on online advertising to drive sales. We appreciate the intent of this bill and the attempts to shield the business community from the fallout of this historic new tax, but we will not be taking a position on the bill at this time. Ultimately, we believe that even with this legislation, the companies targeted by the tax will still find a way to pass the costs on to those buying the ads. You can't legislate the going rate for advertising and this bill won't stop the advertising hosts from simply raising their prices. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for any of the testifiers? All right. Well, this concludes the hearing on this bill. Um, I know you were worried about this, uh, Mr. President, but uh, you know, two bills down, you, you still got it. You didn't lose <laughs> Thank it. you, Mr. Chairman and members. It was, it was an honor and pleasure. All right. Onward and upward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Senate Bill 563, and actually- uh, I'm here, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, just one second, uh, Senator Griffith. Can I ask uh, Senator McRae, do you have the, the list? The testimony list? I don't, Mr. Chair. Oh, uh, Senator Peters have it? I have a list. Uh, the testifiers? Do you have the testifiers? For Senator Griffith's bill? No, all of them, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can you take over for a few minutes? Sure. Actually, I, I, I actually have to hear the first witness, though. Okay. So, uh, uh, cause, uh, I, I noticed that they are, uh, but I'll ask you to take, take the next bill after that, too. Um, Senator Griffith, sorry. That's okay. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, colleagues. It's my pleasure to present Senate Bill 563 for your consideration this afternoon. This bill is a funding bill for local health departments. Now, colleagues, some of you know that in my early years in the House of Delegates, I was actually an employee at Prince George's County Health Department, and I, I ran a program that dealt with disease prevention and wellness promotion and really just meaningful work and a lot of interaction with the community. During the time that I worked there, not because of my presence, but because of a recession, 
health departments all across the state and all of our jurisdictions were impacted by funding decisions we had to make at the time to deal with the recession. And so the state uh, made modifications to what is called core funding for local health departments. Unfortunately, as the economy improved, we did not recalculate that funding. And so this bill, really is to help local health departments with some predictability, uh, some pre predictable funding. Uh, the bill as introduced will increase funding for local health departments through their core funding for the next two years. Um, it does not affect the 2021 budget year. It'll give them flexibility to use the funds uh, in the way that most benefits their constituents. And I know that we all know just being on the ground in this last few years, we all know how important their work is if we didn't before. The bill also uh, it commissions a study be done at, to look at the local health departments and their information systems and how best to mod modernize those systems. Um, there are some other specific parameters of the bill. Um, uh, as you'll see in the fiscal note, it really seeks to develop a floor so that our local health departments can plan for staffing in the many areas of work that they are responsible for. Uh, I do have, I believe, two local health de uh, department uh, chief officers are here to present. The health officer from Prince George's County is here. I see Dr. Carter had signed in the room. So I think the panel, Mr. Chairman, would have two health officers and then Mike Michael Sanderson, who actually brought this bill to my attention, is available for questions and may want to make some comments as well. So I'll pause there. I know it's been a long afternoon already and turn, turn it over back to you, Mr. Chairman, to call on the panel. Thank you, uh, Senator. Um, yes, uh, the first witness is Dr. Uh, Rossman from Howard County. Okay. <laughs> Your health officer. <laughs> that's that's the one who's listed as number one. So I don't know how, how we got somebody from Howard County on this call. I don't know. Hmm. <laughs> Hello. Hey, Doctor. Good to see you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Gazzoni. Thanks for hanging in uh, for for my presentation um, and honorable members of the committee. I'm Dr. Maura Rossman, Health Officer for Howard County Health Department. Yes, we do like to think of us as being number one, um, but I'm also representing MACHO, the Professional Association of the Chief Executives of the state's 24 local health departments. I'm testifying today in strong support of SB 563, which seeks to provide adequate core funding and a secure, sustainable, and equitable funding formula to our local health departments. This past year has highlighted the need for maintaining an appropriate level of funding so public health has the infrastructure to respond to emergencies and non-routine public health issues efficiently and effectively. The chronic underfunding of local health departments and episodic infusion of funding when crises arrives leaves us flat-footed, unprepared, and prevents our communities of achieving healthy outcomes. The term core means the central and most important part of something our core dollars contribute to the bones or critical structure of our modern health departments. These funds support our IT staff who enable our WIC programs, telelectation program, video directly observed therapy for our TB patients, our school-based health centers and telemedicine program, programs located in our public schools and our environmental health and medical electronic health needs. New moms receive education and support so they can successfully breastfeed their infants. TB patients taking medications can be monitored remotely, ensuring treatment is completed on time, especially important during COVID time. Children can be examined and treated by their medical providers without missing school. And our nurses, doctors, environmental health specialists are able to collect data, record visits and inspections and create reports reliably and securely as mandated by regulation and required by grantors. In FY20, Howard County Health Department received 0.1% of the total state's health appropriation and 1% of the total county revenue. How can anyone believe that this level of funding is adequate to maintain a strong core or infrastructure? It is simply impossible for Howard County Health Department and all health departments to provide the essential elements of programs and activities that are mandated and expected by our communities with that level of funding. 
I hope this year has reminded everyone of the value of public health. Now is the time to restore core funding and plan for appropriate funding increases. Our lives depend upon it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Peters, you wanna take over at this point? Yes, sir. We'll now hear from Prince George's County and our health officer since uh, our Howard County friend is leaving for Bill here. Thank you so much. And, and uh, thank you members of the Budget and Taxation Committee and Mr. Chairman, thank you for this opportunity to testify. I am Dr. Ernest Carter. I am the health officer for Prince George's County. And I'm here to express a strong support for Senate Bill 563 on behalf of Prince George's County's Executive Angela Oswald Brooks and the Maryland Association of County Health Officers, which represents the chief executives of Maryland's 24 local health departments. Now the COVID vaccine pandemic has made one thing abundantly clear. Local health departments are the center of public health action. However, we're chronically underfunded and consequently lack the essential infrastructure and appropriate staffing necessary for effective population health management. In FY20, the Prince George's County Health Department received only $73,411 more in state core funding than it did in FY97, but the county's population grew by 25% during that time. Let that sink in for a second. During the Great Recession led to a 35% reduction in local health department core funds in FY09, wiping out the modest funding increases made post FY97. In, in FY13, all other effective state agencies had this core funding restored, but local health departments were never made whole. SB 563 would increase Prince George's County's health department's core funding allocation from 6.6 .6 million to 9.4 million in FY23 and 10.7 million in FY24. This investment in local public health is overdue. SB 563 also adds a critical programmatic area to core funding, data management and exchange services. Effective management of a population health in the 21st century requires significant investment in health information technology. Without this essential infrastructure, our health department does not have the real-time data and analysis necessary for swift public health action. Let me give you an example of the inadequacy of our outdated technology. At our peak, the Prince George's County Health Department did over 3,000 COVID-19 tests per week. However, our electronic health record system is so antiquated that we could not add a testing site assessment directly into the patient's electronic medical record. Instead, we were forced to use paper forms of our patient's assessments. This meant hiring expensive temporary workers to drive to test sites, pick up box paper forms, and scan these records into patient files. After being scanned, this information was not in an analyzable form. To this day, we have not run patient assessment analysis because it would require manual data entry for hundreds of thousands of assessment forms. Increasing the state's investment in local health department infrastructure will solve this and ensure that we're operating with adequate technology, staff, and resources. Thank you, Senator Griffith, for your legislation. This advances local pu public health statewide. Members of the Budget and Taxation Committee, I urge you to invest in health of our residents with a favorable vote for Senate Bill 563. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Carter. Thank you for all the work you've been doing in the county. Are there any questions for Dr. Carter? Seeing none, thank you. Next, we'll hear from Michael Sanderson from MAKO. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Um, Michael Sanderson with the Maryland Association of Counties. Um, big thanks to Madam President Pro Tem for supporting the bill, and, and this very much connects with her background. Um, it's glad to be here before your committee. I've uh, spent this, this uh, session on the public health and public safety beat and have mostly been elsewhere, so this feels more like home for me. Um, the, the panel you've already heard has laid out the bill uh, awfully well. I'll, I'll just cap it off with, with a few closing comments. 
Uh, yes, there's a funding component in this bill for future years. It doesn't affect the budget you're dealing with now, but it does have a fiscal note for future years. But please do understand this bill doesn't even get back to the buying power that our local health departments received from the state in 2008. We're not even getting even to those dollars. So this isn't the big get back. This is just like the baby steps in the right direction. Short version of this is we got bailed out by Congress during this pandemic. And I don't think our public health infrastructure should be left to chance that we can count on the train from Washington to help out yet again. Um, it's the power of rebasing. The 2009 cuts became permanent. You grow from there. You never get back to what you said the priorities were before then. Um, as far as funding flexibility, uh, I think uh, doc, Dr. Carter mentioned uh, technology. I'll just say I, I myself was involved in writing some of the statutes that are now on the books from, from the, the mid 90s on what core funding can be used for, but we never envisioned in the mid 90s that a local health department might need to go out and look at the water and a wastewater tre treatment system to try and determine if COVID has spread into a community. Uh, I don't think the uses in this bill are new. You're not setting new policy. You're just giving assurances to your public health professionals that these are the kind of uses they're supposed to be doing on the ground. And on the technology side, I don't think I can say it better than Dr. Carter just did. We need to be looking forward on technology, having our health professionals sending information by fax to one another so it can be manually entered at a second site is not the way you do data analysis in 2020 and beyond. We just need to do right by them. This bill doesn't solve it. It just asks for the study to frame that conversation. And maybe next year's bill is to solve the problem, but we ought to get a handle on first. With that, Mr. Chair, um, a good bill. We ask for your support. This is one of MAKO's top initiatives this year. Big issue to all of us. Okay, thank you, Michael. Are there any questions for Michael? Okay, seeing none. I have a Vince McAvoy, Senator Griffith. I don't see him. Was in earlier, but he left. Okay. All right. Well, we've got 15 favorables on this bill, so it looks like a good bill. So I would love to have co-sponsors. I didn't have time when the bill was introduced, Mr. Chairman. So if the committee sees fit to move the bill forward, I would welcome and invite and embrace co-sponsors from across the state. Okay. Do you want to wait till we? <laughs> yeah, I just thought I'd throw that up. Unless Kim could, uh, <laughs> in spirit. Um, okay. That concludes the bill hearing for Senate Bill 563. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Senator Zucker. You've got two bills, Senate Bill 591, your overview estimates. Yes. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, distinguished members of the Budget and Taxation Committee. Uh, Senator Craig Zucker here uh, in support of Senate Bill 591. Um, what this, and I've got uh, some witnesses here and folks that can answer some technical uh, questions if need be, but look, this is just about uh, making the uh, uh, tax process more transparent uh, where we can get an, uh, an understanding of sort of what the impact is of taxes. So this is updating, um, uh, our uh, incident study when it comes to uh, the impact of taxes uh, to include a personal income tax, real property, motor fuel. You know, when we're making policy, it's just important to kind of get all the data points and, and this would be uh, go toward that. I wanna thank uh, Senator Elfrith for her co-sponsorship. And I know this is something that uh, her teammate, uh, Delegate Jones has been working on. So again, this is just a, a tax transparency uh, bill. And, and, and I do wanna thank uh, in particular, uh, uh, Andy Shuffle, a friend of mine, uh, who is um, head of the Bureau of Revenue Estimates, who has helped sort of, sort of work through this. Um, we will have an amendment. Uh, you all should see it. But uh, it's just to make sure that agencies are communicating with Mr. Shuffle. That way we have the data. We, we have access to the data that we're requesting. Uh, so with that, I would, I would ask for a favorable report. Happy to answer any questions. Other than that, Mr. Chairman, I'd be go on with our witnesses. Okay, any questions for the Senator? Seeing none, let's go to Callie Schumitz. Callie. Uh, thank you, Senator Peters and members of the committee for allowing me to speak today. And thank you to Senator Zucker for introducing this bill. Um, 
So, uh, my name is Callie Schumitz. I am with the uh, Maryland Center on Economic Policy. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan uh, research and public policy organization. And if we've been in front of you on a couple of different bills this year that are really focused on this issue of increasing transparency around um, the state budget and taxes. Um, so we're here to support um, Senate Bill 5N1 for similar reasons. Um, I think it will help uh, increase transparency and will lead to kind of publishing data that will help policymakers and the general public better understand how our tax system is affecting Marylanders. Um, a large part of portion of the work that we do um, is helping uh, educate people and helping folks better understand the state's fiscal policy choices. Um, one of the most effective tools that we use is uh, a regular analysis that um, an organization called the Institute for Taxation and Economic Policy does called Who Pays that looks at who pays state and local taxes um, by income. And we find that this framing is really useful um, for helping people better understand our tax system as a whole. Um, the, the tax incident study that the uh, state has functions a little bit differently than the methodology that this outside group has developed. Um, however, we think collecting, uh, analyzing and publishing additional data about state collect tax collections, um, including looking at it by income level, um, helps create greater understanding of how our tax system is working. Um, it provides data that is useful to you all as legislators, uh, particularly on this committee, uh, who are weighing these different issues, and to groups like ours that are having regular conversations with Marylanders about state policy. Um, so we think it makes sense to lay out consistent reporting areas to allow comparison over time and ensure that the study is including all the different, um, the most relevant aspects of our, our tax system. So um, we would ask for a favorable report on Senate Bill 591. Thanks. Thank you very much. Any questions for Kaylee? Seeing none. Thank you, Kaylee. We'll move on to Andy. Thank you, Senator Peters, members of Budget and Tax. I want to first thank Senator Zucker and Senator Elforth for their leadership on the bill um, and, and reaching out to BRE to talk about what this bill would do. Um, you know, we're, we're using the word incidents just so everybody's perfectly clear on that. The idea is simply to try to determine who pays the state's taxes. That's very important to you as policymakers anytime you uh, are considering any sort of tax deduction. Currently, our report. Uh, deals in the income tax and the sales tax, which together make up 75% of the general fund. That's typically where we focus. But the motor fuel tax and the real property tax are two other huge taxes that sit out there uh, in the state's you know, overall package of the way we tax our citizens. And it certainly makes quite a bit of sense to understand where those taxes are coming from. Uh, Senator Zucker mentioned that there'll be an, an amendment uh, and Ms. Schumann sort of hinted at this earlier. I think one of the benefits is if we can get these agencies that administer motor fuel and the property tax to interact with us and help us from a data standpoint, we can start to connect that with our income tax data and really let you know uh, by income thresholds who's paying what. And I think that would be of a great benefit to you. Uh, and it kind of goes back to something Michael Sanders said, just said in that last presentation. This is, this is the way it's done in today's day and age. So. Um, you know, I think it's a, it's a great idea to give you all the data you need uh, uh, to make good decisions. And I'm here to answer any questions you might have. Okay, any questions for Andy? All right, thank you, Andy. Looks like we got four favorables, no unfavorables. Looks like a good bill, Senator Zucker. Thank you very much. That's how we like to roll, Mr. Chairman. Okay. All right, let's go to the next bill, Senate Bill 593. Again, Senator Zucker, Homeowners Property Tax Credit. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. My testimony will probably be uh, three minutes and 40 seconds, uh, so you can try to time me. But this is a Montgomery County and Baltimore City uh, priority uh, because uh, since 2005, Montgomery County and Baltimore City homeowners have been shortchanged uh, by a calculation made by the State Department of of assessments taxation, uh, which would which would be uh, millions of dollars that are owed uh, Baltimore City and Montgomery County uh, taxpayers. But what I'd like to do is, Kim, if you could just put up, um, I'd like to yield the rest of my time, three minutes to um, the legislative auditors who did an audit and that's why the Baltimore, Ca Baltimore City and Montgomery County senators are uh, in support of this. 
report is on slide eight. Joe is going to discuss this finding. Thank you, Adam. Again, my name is Joe McWilliams. I'm the fraud investigation manager in charge of OLA's fraud investigation unit. Um, and I'll be discussing finding five of our audit report. This finding describes the results of our investigation into an allegation received through our fraud hotline regarding HTCs that were improperly reduced for certain homeowners. For some background, the majority of HTCs are automatically calculated by DAD's automated system. But there are some circumstances when HTCs are calculated manually by DAT employees, such as when a homeowner just purchased a new home and the credit has to be prorated. Our review identified issues with both methods of calculation, resulting in improper reductions of HTCs awarded to homeowners in Baltimore, Baltimore City and Montgomery County, totaling 4.4 million in fiscal year 2019. The majority of this 4.4 million related to Montgomery County. And that's because DAT's automated system was improperly programmed to deduct a separate credit administered by Montgomery County for the homeowner's property tax liabilities. To illustrate how this works, let's say a 30-year-old homeowner had a state and county property tax liability of $2,000. Depending on other factors such as income level, this homeowner should receive an HTC up to $2,000. Unfortunately, due to the way DAT's automated system calculated the HTC, that wasn't the case. Instead of using the total state and county property tax liability in its calculation, DAT was reducing it by the amount of the other credit administered by Montgomery County. So in this example, the homeowner's $2,000 credit would have been reduced by $692, leaving them with a credit of about $1,300. We couldn't readily determine the amount of improper HTC reductions for years prior to 2019, but we did find that DAT had improperly calculated the credits dating back to at least 2005. We also noted similar issues with the uh, manually calculated credits uh, that were done by DAT employees for 13 homeowners in Montgomery County and Baltimore City. The, the credits for these 13 homeowners were improperly reduced by $6,500. It's important to note that DAT had received advice from its legal counsel in January 2019 that its HTC calculation methodology wasn't proper. However, DAT had not corrected the programming language in its automated system for Montgomery County, and its employees continued to manually calculate the HTCs improperly. I also want to point out that DAT's response to our audit report indicated it did not think the prior year calculations were incorrect because they were consistent with DAT's practice at the time and upheld by Maryland's Property Tax Assessment Appeals Board and Maryland Tax Court decisions. However, this statement is not consistent with DAT's position during our audit field work and after our audit when we discussed the finding with DAT management. This statement is also questionable since our assessment that the calculation was improper was consistent with the advice DAT's legal counsel provided. Finally, DAT's audit report response also stated that because it did not think the prior year calculations were incorrect, it did not plan to compensate homeowners for prior year tax credits. That concludes my comments on finding five. I'll turn it back to Adam for the rest of the presentation. Kim, thank you very much. So this is righting a wrong. What this bill does is working with Baltimore City and Montgomery County. It extends, uh, it pays back Montgomery County and Baltimore City homeowners uh, for three tax years over a span of six years is just writing a wrong. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for the sponsor? Okay, I have Lewis Willen. Mr. Willen? Yes, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, yes, I'm Lewis Willen, I live in Olney, Maryland. Uh, so you have my written testimony that includes a sample HTC worksheet from SDAT that provides some details about the source of the error and also included is a tax court decision referenced in my testimony. Uh, and, with, and there's a more description about the tax court decision in, in the testimony. And there's also some sections of the uh, OLA audit that uh, Mr. McWilliams uh, uh, spoke about. Uh, I'm asking for a favorable report with uh, suggested amendments and that's all I have, thank you. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I do want to give a shout out to Mr. Willen. He's a constituent of mine and has really been on top of this stuff. So Mr. Willen, thank you for always being so diligent with these type of issues. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Willen. Um, Michael Sanderson's next. Michael, you here? Mr. Mr. Chair, Michael Sanderson with the Maryland Association of Counties. This is exactly the right way to handle a troubling issue. Do the right thing, pass the bill. Thank you. Great testimony on this bill. <laughs> All right, any questions for Michael? Seeing none. All right, this concludes the bill hearing for Senate Bill 593. All right, next we're gonna go to Allegheny County. Senator Edwards, Senate Bill 620, income tax subtraction for volunteer fire rescue or emergency medical service members. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 
Senate Bill 620 uh, is an important bill. As many, rural, particularly rural areas, rely a lot on volunteers. And uh, I believe it was 2014, we passed the first subtraction modification, uh, income tax subtraction phased in over nine years, modified that in 2018 to get the maximum, I believe, 7,000 2022. What this bill does helps those in the fire and EMS community who at no fault of their own because of the pandemic have been unable to respond to calls or work in fundraisers or other things affiliated with their operations uh, to be able to do points. I'm not an expert in this, but I think there's still a couple people on here who are gonna testify. Uh, one had to get off because you had to get to work, but there's a point system in order to be able to gain this subtraction. And because of the COVID, a lot of them can't do, they do a lot of fundraisers which count toward getting points. They work on equipment and all that. And because of the COVID, they can't go in and work in groups to do that. So this is an attempt uh, to help those people keep their certification uh, and not lose it because they didn't reach a point total that, that you need to have to be considered uh, eligible for the program. Uh, there's two, two proposed amendments. Uh, uh, Delegate McKay kind of had this up on the House and he taught, uh, we have a gentleman who represents the uh, Maryland State Firemen Association. Said they didn't support it. They didn't really give total reasons why. I thought it might impact the other parts of the states differently. So there's two amendments. One makes it an emergency bill. Uh, another one clarifies uh, the active status for a member of a certain group, volunteer fire rescue emergency medical services organization or an auxiliary organization. And we've restricted it to three counties, Allegheny, Garrett, and Washington counties. Uh, and this was for two years uh, from uh, December 31, 2019 uh, to January 1, 2022. So it's not extended out past that without a uh, legislation to, to do that if needed. Hopefully the pandemic's over, but then everybody get back to normal. <clears throat> I would ask for your support of the bill. I know I think there's a couple people from way out in the mountains still on here. I see Jim Powell's and uh, I don't know if Mr. Frank, John Frank's on here yet or not. I see him. Yeah. yeah, there he is. I'm sorry. To, uh, unless anybody has any questions for Senator Edwards, we'll go to uh, James Piles. Mr. Piles. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, members of the committee. My name is James Piles. I'm a retired major with the Maryland State Police. As a major with the State Police, I was the commander of the Northern Command for the Criminal Enforcement Division. I was also the lead for the Maryland State Police on the heroin and opioid epidemic. I then served three years as the Chief of Police and Director of Safety and Security for the Maryland Department of Health. February of 2019, I was appointed Director of Emergency Services for Allegheny County. From just my retirement of three years prior in 2015 to 2019, I was alarmed by the amount of volunteers, the loss of volunteers here in Allegheny County. It's not only in Allegheny County, it's in Garrett County, it's in Washington County, it's in many rural counties, not just in Maryland, all across the United States. As Senator Edwards noted, his open remarks. Our volunteer organizations have struggled during COVID-19. A decreasing, uh, not as many members can respond on a call. When a call comes in, we start on call based upon the information received is the amount of fire trucks that's going to roll, the amount of ambulance trucks that's going to roll, the amount of brush trucks is going to roll. As Senator Edwards also noted, lack of fundraisers. They can't have meetings to meet their low SAP points in which they uh, then get a retirement. Low SAP is length of service retirement program. So is for all these reasons, we need every incentive, whether it be this Maryland income tax incentive or every incentive we can to recruit and retain volunteers, not only in Allegheny County, in the state of Maryland, uh, to include the three counties noted, Garrett, uh, Allegheny, and Washington County. Therefore, I fully support a favorable report for Senate Bill 620. Okay, any questions for Mr. Piles? Seeing none, next we'll hear from uh, Mr. John Frank. Yes, 
Greeting, Mr. Chair and committee members. Uh, lovely, snowy Garrett County. Uh, I echo as far as James uh, Powell's uh, statement. I have been a volunteer paramedic firefighter for 38 years now. I too am still a duty sworn police officer. I'm appointed as the director of emergency management. Uh, Garrett County has 11 volunteer fire and rescue stations and three volunteer uh, EMS stations. Uh, the county supports with a 24 seven paramedic. Uh, give you an idea, over the last five years, we have declined in membership of 10.5%. Uh, in reference to Senator Edwards uh, comments about the point system, right now, uh, because of the pandemic and the health emergency that we're currently in, most fire companies are only open for emergency calls and those essential staff. So they're not able to get points category for face-to-face -face training, uh, for drills. Uh, then we have to remember our auxiliary members, which are uh, our older members that may not necessarily go on emergency calls anymore, but they are crucial for maintaining that uh, volunteer organization with fundraisers, dinners, bingo, uh, and so on. Uh, I just want to say I'd, I'd greatly appreciate your consideration. I fully support this bill. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Any questions for Mr. Frank? Mr. Chairman, uh, Tim Dayton was on. He's been very active over the years. I think he's with the state fire marshal now. So he had to get back to work. So he had to, he had to get off. Okay. Thank you, Senator. Thank you guys for testifying. Okay, that concludes the bill hearing. Let's go to Senate Bill 640, Senator Alfred. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the committee, for the record, Senator Sarah Elfrith rep representing Maryland's 30th district. I'm here to present Senate Bill 640, which is it, it's a, our attempt at a creative idea for a problem I know we all um, spent a lot of time thinking about over the interim, which is how to get direct relief to our constituents in long standing states of emergency. Um, I know we are all uh, out there on food distribution lines, uh, fielding calls, uh, countless calls from constituents who are struggling to pay rent or pay utilities, keep the heat on, et cetera. Um, and because we were not in session, we had very little capacity as a body to, to get funding to our most vulnerable neighbors. So Senate Bill 640, it's our, it's our creative attempt to try to solve that problem, um, which it's, it's quite simple, and I'd like to thank Philip on the committee for helping us think through this, but it would create an emergency community services fund, so a special fund of $10 million to be authorized for use by the Legislative Policy Committee in circumstances of economic downturn and or uh, prolonged states of emergency. The fund would be used uh, to respond without any undue delay and provide nimble and necessary funding for, uh, out we outlined in the bill, food and nutrition assistance, rental and housing assistance, and energy assistance um, during, again, prolonged states of emergency or prolonged uh, periods of high unemployment. Um, this, this is really, a, a, you know, I, I wanna present this idea as a creative solution to the committee. I'm curious to hear people's thoughts on this, uh, but when we're not here, it would be wonderful to have such a fund that uh, when we have this trigger of a prolonged state of emergency, sustained period of unemployment, that the LPC can work with the governor and the comptroller to get these funds out immediately to our constituents as they need them. So Mr. Chair, I have a number of folks uh, on the panel who have been on the front lines, uh, have before this pandemic in the last 11 months, will continue to do so, but can speak to the great need that is out there. And, and frankly, it's not gonna go away anytime soon. And with that, I request a favorable report. Thank you. Okay, uh, I am back. Thank you, Senator Peters. Um, okay, the first to testify is Carmen Del. Oh, I know this name. Too. <laughs> I know that I know who you are. <laughs> That's okay, Carmen's fine. I'm a little bit like Cher, you know. Uh, uh, not, I don't really have a last name. That's I'll, cool, I'll right? take that. I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Carmen Del Guecho. I'm uh, CEO and President of the Maryland Food Bank, and I'm here today on behalf of Senate Bill 640, sponsored by Senator Elf 
Elfrith, which provides emergency funds to local nonprofits in our state. Um, you know, there's no doubt that a lack of funding in the early days of this pandemic truly, from the Maryland Food Bank's perspective, slowed our ability to respond to the sudden and dramatic increase in need for food assistance across Maryland. You know, typically um, emergency feeding efforts stand up after short-term emergencies like hurricanes and last, you know, for days, sometimes weeks, but clearly uh, as a center reference, this was an extended period, a much different scenario. And when COVID-19 hit, our analysis showed that we needed to double our food distribution operations for the foreseeable future, which proved to be true. Um, our initial forecast also showed that the cost of the first 90 days of that, uh, for that level of work would be about $12 million over and above our normal operating expenses. That too proved to be true. Um, and so uh, we began early on to purchase food on, um, on the belief and frankly the hope that funding would soon follow. Uh, it's not an ideal model that we would really like to replicate and, um, and certainly there's no guarantee that in future emergencies, nonprofit providers will be able to respond at the level required uh, without the guarantee of financial support. And so having a dedicated funding um, ready to deploy immediately to keep critical social service supports flowing during the emergency is really a common sense measure that protects Marylanders during really chaotic and vulnerable events. It also ensures that organizations that are best positioned to provide this immediate solutions are able to do so. Um, and I think, as I mentioned, you know, our, our, our early response, frankly, was limited. It was limited by our own financial constraints. We, um, we early on in the process, uh, dipped into our reserves to the tune of half a million dollars to try to buy as much food as we possibly can, knowing that this, this need was gonna be significant. Of course, we're $21 million later, so half a million wasn't, wasn't gonna get us very far, but had we known this financial support was in place, we certainly could have been even more aggressive out of the gates in our purchasing, in the amount of food we were purchasing. Um, we could have uh, you know, potentially provided better variety. We could have negotiated better prices. And frankly, I think we could have avoided some of the supply chain challenge that quickly ensued. And so in the end, I think we, despite the fact that I'm very proud of the work we have done over the last 10 months and the nearly enough food to provide nearly 60 million, pound, uh, 60 million meals, which is our highest in our 40 year history, I think we could have done a better job with funds like this to serve our communities out of the gate here at a time when anxieties were high, fears were, fears were high, and at a time when you know, communities needed it most. And so with that spirit, uh, the Maryland Food Bank stands behind this bill wholeheartedly, and we urge the committee to adopt a favorable report of Senate Bill 640, and I, and I truly appreciate the opportunity to speak on its behalf today. Thank you very much. Uh, next up is Lisa, uh, Lisa Saro. Saro. Good afternoon, uh, committee chair and members of the committee. My name is Lisa Saro. I am the um, general counsel for Arundel Community Development Services. And as you heard earlier from Kathy Koch today, um, ACDS serves as Anne Arundel County's nonprofit housing and community development agency. Um, we provide um, help with residents finding um, the provision of safe, affordable housing opportunities. And most recently in the last uh, year or so, we have been a uh, provider of direct services for emergency rental assistance. And we have also worked with nonprofits um, in our community to get funds to them to run their own emergency rental assistance programs. Um, it, all, all providers of um, rental assistance are most all community development agencies for counties throughout the state had some form of rental assistance programs before COVID happened. But when the COVID crisis hit, these programs throughout the state really had to ramp up and create an infrastructure for providing rental assistance to ensure that folks who had, you know, literally overnight, um, lost their jobs, lost their ability to pay rent, um, we all had to come up with a quick way to get the CARES funds primarily into the pockets of the landlords throughout the state. Um, 
it, just in Anne Arundel County alone, between um, March and the end of last year, we we in we introduced about five million dollars um, into the community. That didn't just benefit the tenants. Um, who were able to keep roofs over their heads, but it also helped the landlords. They were able to pay their mortgages. They kept the money flowing in. Um, since that time, since we all started up, um, we've been honing those programs. And uh, at this point, we've got you know $400 million coming into the state with uh, the money that was appropriated at the end of last year programs are now sort of really, really narrowing in on how to get that money out quickly. Um, so the reason I'm saying this is um, while the funding for these programs over the last year or so has been um, primarily federal funding and a result of the COVID emergency, COVID, um, you know, <laughs> God willing, is at some point going to end. Um, and we will have further emergencies in the future. Uh, what we have now is infrastructure in place throughout the state to ensure that rental assistance funds, if they are available, if they are made available um, through this bill, uh, those funds could get out in a very short period of time because the infrastructure is there. Um, as you all know, eviction is a traumatizing, life-altering um, event in any instance, but in the midst of an emergency, it's absolutely devastating. Um, not only do folks lose their housing, um, if they are not able to move their property out of the house before the eviction takes place, they lose everything. Literally everything is moved out of the house, furniture, medications, um, everything the kids own, um, and, and something you may not know or, or, or may, the single greatest predictor of eviction is a child in the household. So these are families. And in an emergency situation, losing their homes because the, we can't get money to their landlords fast enough, it is a tragedy. It would be a tragedy. Um, so we, we strongly, strongly urge a favorable report on this. Um, again, the infrastructure is in place. Um, and one more thing I just want to share that rental assistance programs get that money directly to the landlords. It's paid to the landlords. Um, so there's not any middle person going through. The landlords do well, the tenants do well, the communities do well, the state does well because folks are not, um, are not losing their housing and in need of the emergency um, funds that they need when they're homeless, when they're then homeless. So um, again, we urge a very favorable report on, um, on this bill and thank you for your time. Thank you very much. All right, uh, the last person signed up is Vince McAvoy. Great. Thank you so much, Senator, I appreciate it. Sure. Um, I want to applaud those that stepped up and I've seen them locally and I've seen them on TV across the state. Um, but I feel and would urge the committee to review this from the perspective of people staying in their lanes. This issue was, was created and worsened by an executive order. And though there are three outstanding bills this term uh, from senators and delegates, and though there are proceedings in the court, this issue was exacerbated and has been allowed to carry on for an entire year. The, the very thought that we have to create a separate fund for an impending emergency in the future should shake us all. We, we I, I don't know the details of releasing rainy day funds. I know they're substantial. Um, we did not call the legislature back in session and the data just doesn't bear this out. 
it doesn't bear out destroying Maryland's economy, destroying businesses who have had family businesses for generations, two and three. I've seen in Baltimore, I've seen businesses that made it through two world wars, the recessions closed by COVID, closed by the state's action to COVID. So yes, we, we should have something in a place to take care of our folks. And we do have those administrative uh, agencies, DHS, um, social services. We have what we can reach out to in our own communities. And we have it substantial in, in Baltimore even still, not as much as we used to, but, but plenty still. Um, and, and that is how this should be tackled. So I'd urge you unfavorable on this bill and, and not just an unfavor, but returning with the resolve to say, look, this won't happen again. We won't let an executive or a series of executives as it applies to the counties and they all uh, level, put our residents, our Marylanders, people born here, these people born here, their families lived here generations. We won't put it through them again, put them through this again. And, and I, I appreciate the committee listening. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Any questions for any of the testifiers? Thank you all very much. Let's move on to Senate Bill 647, Senator King, Federal COVID-19 Relief Funding Report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senate Bill 647, which is an emergency bill, will require the Department of Budget and Management to report on or before March 15th on all federal COVID-19 relief funding received by the state or a political subdivision of the state, as well as any funding needs to which the governor will prioritize federal funding received after the report date. Understanding exactly how Maryland has used the hundreds of millions of dollars from the federal government will allow us to identify any potential programs or groups that did not receive enough assistance. And it will also ensure the General Assembly has all of the information necessary to evaluate and assess the program's successes and efficiencies. Uh, very simply, my colleagues, this legislation will require the transparency and accountability that we should have been getting all along, and I respectfully request a favorable report on Senate Bill 647. Thank you very much, Senator. This is important. Um, as, uh, as we all know, it's been a little challenging to get all the information as the Senator points out. Um, and, uh, our, oh, Senator Rosica, there's a question. Thank you, no, I just wanna say, I think it was a great bill, Senator King. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. And Senator Rosica, you did a marvelous job on the floor this morning. Oh, well, thanks for your help. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, no witnesses on that bill? Next up is my bill, uh, 659, Historic uh, Revitalization Tax Credit, Small Commercial Projects Alterations. So um, very simply, I'm gonna let the folks who are here to testify, fill in the gaps. But this is our um, historic tax credit program for the state. And um, it's been running at $4 million. This ups at a million specifically for the small commercial program. And uh, obviously they, they, we've seen a lot of good work um, from this program and main streets and all across the, the state. So uh, I'm gonna let those the folks talk from Preservation Maryland first, Eleanor Cowan. Thanks so much, Chair Gazzoni. Um, my name is uh, Ellie Cowan and I am the Director of Advocacy at Preservation Maryland. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today in support of Senate Bill 659, which um, as uh, Senator Gazzoni said, uh, would extend the life of the small commercial program of the historic tax credit uh, by increasing the authorization uh, by an additional uh, $1 million. Um, the small commercial credit is uh, uh, widely embraced and it's a successful tool for um, encouraging the economic and neighborhood revitalization uh, in Maryland's communities, you know, throughout the state. 
Um, the economic revival of our small towns and urban downtowns requires incentives like the historic tax credit to focus investment where it's needed most. Um, and as we're recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the state really needs to prioritize its programs that we know work and encourage job growth and stimulate investment and revitalization. And so the small commercial historic tax program was established in 2015, and it was to encourage the redevelopment of um, modest Main Street type rehabs, um, usually taken on by individuals or small developers. Um, the projects uh, range from those with $5,000 to $500,000 in qualified rehabilitation expenditures, and there is a per project cap of about $50,000 uh, in credits uh, in a 24 month period. Um, the legislative legislation creating this program authorized the Maryland Historical Trust to issue initial credit certificates for projects in an amount not to exceed $4 million in credits. Unfortunately, because of the success of the program, uh, as of 2020, the program has been fully subscribed, leaving many shovel-ready projects unable to move forward. Fortunately, uh, with the uh, increase in authorized funding through SB 659, uh, we can avoid a drop off in redevelopment projects um, and it can be accomplished without a dramatic fiscal impact uh, thanks to the powerful return on investment inherent in this tax credit, historic tax credit program, um, according to a recently released ABLE Foundation report on the economic impact of the program, every dollar in historic tax credits results in $8.13 in economic activity. Um, so the, um, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a cataclysmic effect on the revitalization economy, um, which runs the gamut from developers, contractors, architects, craftsmen. It employs thousands of Marylanders in good paying permanent positions. This legislation could help counteract some of those negative financial aspects on historic preservation as a community development tool. Um, this tax credit is key for the individuals and small developers uh, to help bridge financing gaps that would otherwise stall or kill their projects entirely. Um, and so, you know, this is a really great program. It helps focus uh, investment into historically disinvested his com communities all across the state from Western Maryland to the Eastern shore. It's not a handout. It's an investment in, in um, our Maryland's history, our neighborhoods, and I respectfully request a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is Sakina Linder. Good afternoon. Chair Gazone and members of the committee. My name is Sakina Linder. Thank you for the chance to offer my support for Senate Bill 659, the Historic Revitalization Tax Credit for Small Commercial Projects. As Ellie Cowan of Preservation Maryland has noted, the economic benefit to the state from this program is clear. Eight to one return on investment and significant job creation. As a real estate development consultant, I would like to emphasize that this vital program not only has a meaningful return on investment for the state, but it also helps to preserve housing affordability. I represent small developers as part of my business who would have liked to use the small commercial tax credit program last year to complete the renovation of vacant historic row homes in Baltimore City for resale. However, since funding ran out, the projects are currently on hold. Applying the tax credit allows for these housing developers to keep their properties affordable to prospective low income home buyers. The historic revitalization tax credit for small commercial projects is an economic development financing tool, which preserves the historic fabric of Maryland's oldest communities. Investing in this relatively young program is smart stewardship. By approving a million dollars to the small commercial tax credit program, small business owners and developers will invest in their communities, incentivizing others to do the same. For the affirmation reasons, I respectfully urge a favorable report on Senate Bill 659. 
Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Uh, John uh, Renner. Thank you, Chair Gazan and members of the committee for the opportunity to provide testimony in support of the bill. Uh, my, my name is John Renner and I am the head of real estate development at Cross Street Partners. Uh, first, I'd like to say I've worked a bunch of different places, a bunch of different states and um, the state of Maryland is fantastic in terms of its support for community revitalization and historic preservation specifically. Uh, the, the program we're talking about today, the historic revitalization tax credit for small commercial projects is a program that un unambiguously works and it would be sh a shame to see such an effective program expire due to lack of funding. We're the lead developer on Henderson Crossing. It's a 55 unit row home rehab project in East Baltimore, close to Hopkins Hospital. Um, to date, we've completed about seven houses at Henderson Crossing, and we have 12 more that are under construction. Uh, the project has secured about 1 million uh, in tax credits through this program, through its history. When we started at Henderson Crossing, the houses were totally dilapidated shells, a blight on the surrounding community, which includes a popular K through eight school, as well as the Hopkins medical campus and uh, hospital. Faithfully preserving what's left of these houses, creating workforce housing near major employment centers and rebuilding Baltimore City's tax base one house at a time is the essence of community revitalization. Uh, despite pretty strong market conditions and support from Maryland DHCD, there is a significant funding gap between what it costs to develop each house and what we can sell them for. On average with options and all the upgrades, our average sales price is $290,000. The total development cost for each unit is a whopping $340,000 and pandemic era uh, material price inflation has exacerbated this imbalance. Henderson Crossing and other projects like it around the state of Maryland would not be remotely financially feasible without the small commercial tax credit program. The tax credit fills the gap and creates a business case for doing these small historic preservation projects. If, this, if the bill isn't passed and additional funding isn't put into this program, I have no idea how we'll finish Henderson Crossing and we certainly won't be starting other small commercial projects around our um, our existing projects in Cambridge. Hey, Ryan, if, we, if you could, uh, I'm I'm done there. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Th thank you very much. Okay, I think that was it. Yes. Anybody have questions? Please, witnesses. Oh, yes, Senator Young. Well, you're you're on mute. Thank you. Um, I'm in total support of these type of projects, but I'm just a little confused in terms of why housing projects being thrown under commercial versus a housing project. It would seem like they were two different programs. Um, so. Uh, so they are in certain ways. So there's the residential program that's for homeowners already. This is small commercial. So it's for um, either individuals or small developers who are taking on projects to do the rehabilitation, uh, the historic rehabilitation and then sell it to a homeowner. Um, and that's what makes it a, a commercial versus just the, the residential credit. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm still in agreement with trying to do this kind of programs, but I'm not sure I'm in agreement with commercial being used that way. But anyhow, thank you. Okay, very good. Thank you. That concludes the hearing on that bill. Next up uh, is uh, Senate Bill 660. Um, 
State Lottery Fund, Maryland Humanities Council funding. This is mine also. Um, this is an interesting situation on this bill right now. Um, uh, I'm going to guess that no one disagrees with the idea of their annual grant. Um, there seems to be some um, confusion. Maybe it's resolved already. I hope it is, even in the last couple of days with the um, Department of uh, Budget Management. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll let the, uh, the folks um, from the Humanities Council address whether they think everything is satisfied. Um, it, apparently, the budget management believes that, um, th that uh, Humanities is getting the grant um, already in some form. So um, I'll, let, I'll let the, uh, the folks from Humanities address that. And bottom line is we'll, we'll work this out at the end of the day. Whatever it is, we'll work it out. Um, Lindsay Baker. You're on mute. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the Budget and Taxation Committee. I will address the, um, the emails that have been going back and forth. I'm going to read a little bit of our statement and then I'll jump to that. I'm Lindsay Baker, Executive Director of Maryland Humanities, and I want to thank Chairman Gazzoni and the members of the committee for hearing me in support of Senate Bill 660 and the chairman for his sponsorship of it. I have been a partner to and fan of Maryland Humanities for many years before joining the organization this past summer. I have long found their work to have an abiding impact on communities throughout the state, and I am privileged to now lead them. This bill would update existing legislation to clarify the source of an annual grant that has proven vital to the continued high level of service that is Maryland Humanities custom. Maryland Humanities was very fortunate to be included in the original 2016 legislation, which provided $150,000 annually for two years, FY18 and 19, to support our service to Marylanders via our programs, including Maryland History Day. During the 2018 session, new legislation passed striking the end date for the funding. It was clear that the will of the General Assembly was to provide this funding on a stable and permanent basis as the bill passed unanimously in both chambers. However, in early FY20, an issue with language in the legislation meant that the state could not legally dispense the grant as directed. Working with Senator Brinkley and his team at DBM, a solution was found for 20, FY20. Governor Hogan generously included the $150,000 in a separate annual grant using monies from the general fund received via the Maryland Historical Trust and the Department of Planning for FY20 and proposed the same for FY22. We have recently received assurance that Governor Hogan will include it in our FY23 grant too. Through this bill, we simply seek to have the funding for this annual grant specified and insured for the long term. This funding has been critical to our ability to meet the needs of those we serve, both youth and adults. Maryland Humanities programs consistently reach more than a quarter million Marylanders statewide and did so again in 2020. We offered more than a thousand events last year, both in person and virtual, with direct partners participation by more than 83,000 people and an additional audience of 192,000 thanks to grant supported events and mass communications. We have been able to accelerate our program service thanks to the enhanced resources offered by this $150,000 received each year since FY21. And originally I had planned to tell you all about the great work that we do um, with Maryland History Day Museums on Main Street, One Maryland, One Book, and our grant program where we provide funding to organizations throughout the state. Um, last year, up to $148,000 benefiting 28 organizations. We typically leverage the state's investment in our work between four and six times over in any given fiscal year, supporting hundreds of community partners with innovative programming and providing full-time employment for a staff of 15. To address Senator Cazzone's question um, or raising of the issue that's been going back and forth, we understand that the governor has been supportive of this funding in the past and through FY23, but we simply want to ensure that we have um, the appropriate levers in place to continue it past FY23. We are not in we are not sure that we have that yet. And so that is the purpose of this bill. And we respectfully ask that the members of the committee approve the bill to ensure that the overwhelming mandate of the Maryland General Assembly to provide this funding annually is fulfilled. And um, Senator Gazzone, if I did not answer your question, I'm happy to do so. No, I, I, th I think I got it. Um, next up is Janet Clark Green. 
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Janet Vianna Clark Green, and I have been an educator for 25 years. I've lived and I've taught in numerous countries and have impacted lives of thousands of learners over the years, and they in turn have impacted their communities. Today, I'm here to share the positive impact that the Maryland Humanities Council have had on students, myself, and my community, and the reason my, why funding for this bill ought to be supported. I started attending programs supported by the Maryland Humanities over 10 years ago because I was driven by the high caliber and diversity of the programs offered. I became enthralled and developed a great passion for history through their National History Day program and the One Maryland Book Program and the Letters About Literature, which is no longer offered. Through the sponsorship of programs like these, my love and value for history and rich literature was further developed. And as the years progressed, it crept into my classroom where I shared this passion with my students. The rigorous trainings through these programs not only helped me to become a more competent educator, they afforded me the opportunity to help my learners become stress, successful students and wonderful citizens. My students were able to garner new skills and also to think creatively and critically, to reason, to ask questions and gain new insights into the world. Mike, I have a current ninth grader, Dama Lola. She was with me last year because I'm a middle school teacher. Shared with me, hadn't she not gotten involved in National History Day and Letters About Literature, she would not be able to assert herself as a leader who is not easily convinced without knowing the facts. So she has to know the facts before anyone tries to convince her. Ladies and gentlemen, funding on the Maryland Humanities Council is very crucial. Today, I plead with everyone here to support funding for Bill SB 6606, as it helps the students, teachers like myself to become better citizens and see the world through different light. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Matthew Pallet, Nick? Yes, thank you. Can you all hear me? We can. Excellent. Good afternoon. Thank you to the committee for this opportunity to speak in support of Maryland Humanities in SB 660. Let me introduce myself. My name is Matthew Palotnik, a graduate of Poolsville High School and three-time Maryland History Day winner. In the fall, I will matriculate at the University of Cambridge to study history. What I learned by competing in National History Day was instrumental to my education. My work for NHD served as part of my application to Cambridge. I was required to share two pieces of historical research, both of which were NHD projects. One was a paper on urban planning innovator, Jane Jacobs, and the other website about Julius Rosenwald, the philanthropist and advocate for African-American education. The conducting of primary source research, the backbone of History Day, is a vital preparation for my education at Cambridge. I not only learned about history through Maryland Humanities programs, however, I also learned how to think. Young people today come of age in an era dominated by misinformation in which facts have for many become indistinguishable from lies. The two most important tactics in combating this crisis of truth are the ability to understand information, its origin, its reliability, and how it fits into context. <clears throat> and additionally, the construction of a narrative to not only establish fact, but to combat deception directly. Maryland Humanities not only teaches tens of thousands of students across Maryland academic subjects, but also information literacy skills vital in the success as informed citizens of our democratic society. Students will take the skills they learn in Maryland Humanities programs not only in the form of an appreciation for literature, culture, and history, but also in the form of intellectual rigor and informed discussion they might not otherwise receive. To safeguard this funding is not only important to the study of the humanities in our state, it is important to the future of citizenship in Maryland. For these reasons, I respectfully request a favorable report on Senate Bill 660. Thank you. Wow, hard to argue with that. Great job. Uh, and good luck to you uh, at Cambridge. Uh, Thank you. Any questions? Uh, I think that's it. Oh, wait, I have one more on here, I guess. Uh, unless this was a mistake, is uh, John um, Rayner? 
Did you want to be on this bill also? Yeah, I thought maybe that might have been a mistake. Okay, any questions for anyone? Very good. Thank you all very much. Have a great day. Senate Bill 678, Senator Edwards, Task Force on Economic Future of Western Maryland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Members of the committee, uh, past year we passed a bill to establish this task force. Task force has worked very, very hard, and it's a little difficult when you can't meet in person. We had a total of 14 uh, or seven virtually meetings that lasted a considerable amount of time. I think we got a lot accomplished in that period of time. We have 14 initial recommendations. We have six bills in this year, most of which you're gonna be hearing in the not too distant future. Uh, all this bill does extends because we didn't have time to get everything done, extends uh, from January 1st, 2021 to October the 1st, 21, extend, and extends the, door rate, extends the task force out and extends the duration task force by six months. Uh, and we have to have a report in by October the 1st. So I would appreciate your support of the bill. Very good. I don't think we have any, no witnesses on this. So any questions for the Senator? Thank you much, uh, Senator Edwards. Uh, last bill for today, uh, for the hearing. Of course, we have voting right after, as you all remember. Um, Senate Bill 718, Senator Zucker, Burtonsville Crossing. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I will keep my uh, testimony short because I don't wanna take up any more time on Burtonsville uh, than has already taken over the last 10 years. Property that is uh, really a gateway to Howard County and Providence County uh, uh, has really become abandoned. Uh, it was once a thriving uh, shopping center uh, <laughs> Edens. And when the anchor uh, tenant giant moved across the street, one by one, each store uh, vacated. And, uh, you know, Mr. Chairman, colleagues, I think you know me well enough to know that, you know, it's important to keep your promises in, in public service. And uh, myself and the District 14 delegation, I made a promise to this, uh, to this community that we were going to do all we can to help uh, rehabilitate the shopping center. It really is a local issue, but um, Nothing has been done over the last 10 years and, and we said that enough is enough. So uh, uh, as you know, if we can't find a way, we'll make one. So what this bill does is it requires the state to take over the property uh, because our constituents deserve something to, go, to happen there. And uh, we're all in. Uh, this is a promise that we intend to fulfill. And, uh, and uh, I would you know, ask you guys to stick with, with me and the team to, to do what we can for this community. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions for the Senator. Okay, seeing none, Senator, we obviously are gonna help you in every way we can on your local issues. Um, so. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, that concludes the hearing for today. And uh, as I said, we will begin uh, very shortly as soon as everybody can gather um, for the